Hello and welcome to GameSack. This time we're talking about arcade games. You know, Dave, arcades were kind of like the movie theaters of gaming. You know, a lot of games would appear in the arcade first and then be ported to the home where people could enjoy and love them forever. You're exactly right, Joe. Absolutely. The, the arcades were a wondrous, awesome place. I used to love going there because I yep. could look forward to a game that I really liked there to come home on the home console. Yeah. But not all games came to the home console. Yeah. So that's what we're talking about today are games that were released in the arcade but never made it out of there. So yeah. So, yeah, unfortunately, we don't have all the arcade boards that the games we're going to talk about today. So we're going to have to resort to emulation. It's something that we don't like to do. We like to show you games running on the actual hardware. But, you know, emulation is the only way that a lot of people can even play these games anymore. So Yeah, the emulation is a dirty word anyways. <laughs> but uh, we do have a lot of games to take a look at. So we should really get going. Gangbusters by Konami is a cops and robbers overhead run and gun. You take control of some freaky haired punk cops roaming the deadly streets to catch criminals. If you catch a criminal in the act, you can tow him behind you. Once you get to a police van, you submit all of the prisoners you've caught in order to send to jail to earn points. Pretty cool concept. Of course, all the other criminals you simply shoot dead, no jail for them. I'm wondering why you're even bothering to catch some criminals in the first place. Why not just shoot them all? I mean, there are a hundred of them shooting at you. When you shoot an eligible criminal, he starts crying for help. help. What's going on with this? Is he asking you for help or is he calling for help from his buddies? The graphics are kind of bland in this one and overall so is the game. Yeah, and you can say the same about the music too. This game could definitely use a strafe button, but overall I really didn't care for this one. I'm pretty sure I would have passed the game up in the arcades for something much better. The game gets really difficult in the upper levels too. The brilliantly named Psycho Nix Oscar is a very interesting little game. Basically, it's a run and gun with a selective power-up system. Looking at the game, it kind of makes me think that they took Turrican and Gradius and smashed them into one game. It's pretty damn hard, though. You can't take a lot of damage before you die, and when you do die, you get sent back. This game wants to challenge you as a player rather than being all about the quarters. Okay, I guess it wants your quarters, too, as you will be spending a lot of them to learn this game. But once you get powered up a bit, it really feels like you're unstoppable. But if you die, and you will, you start out really weak again. To be honest, if I saw this game in an arcade, I'd probably overlook it. I think that a lot of people might. It's a shame too, as it's pretty fun for the most part, and the challenge only helps make it more addicting. I like this game. Lots of solid action and the Gradius style upgrade system works well. I'm sure I would have dumped at least $10 into this game over its lifetime in the arcade. Devastators by Konami is a run and gun game, I guess. <laughs> yeah, right. It's actually more of a walking gun. Basically, you take control of a Rambo wannabe and run into the screen, defeating your enemies and progressing into new stages. This game was in a convenience store near my high school, so I played it a few times there. At the time, I was impressed with all of the scaling going on. This was well before systems like the Super Nintendo or the Sega CD came out, so hopefully you can see how I thought this was kind of neat. Still, it doesn't really compare with the earlier Sega arcade games, which had much better scaling. It hasn't really aged very well. The graphics are kind of bland, the music and sounds aren't very memorable, and the game moves slower than tepid fudge, as Dave would say. The game could have been better paced, I feel. And your guy can only shoot about 10 to 20 feet ahead of him. Yeah, and it looks like he's shooting at the ground, too. You do have secondary weapons like grenades and also a rocket launcher, which can be used when you see the crosshairs on an enemy vehicle. I think it never came home because only the Neo Geo could handle it, and Konami didn't make games for the Neo Geo. Oh well, fine by me. It's a nice effort by Konami, but like Joe says, it didn't age well. It's just too slow and not very exciting. Oh, 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 oh. 
G.I. Joe is a spiritual sequel to Devastators, and it's also by Konami, of course. As you can see, they vastly improved the graphics and gameplay here. The pace is much faster, the scrolling is now automatic, and it keeps the action coming. You now have a crosshair to use to shoot, and you also use that to pick up power-ups and whatnot. It kind of reminds me of Dynamite Duke with a crosshair action, but instead you're going forward instead of side to side. Anyway, you can choose from four Joes, but Snake Eyes really doesn't look anything like the Snake Eyes I remember. Plus, he even speaks. Yo, Joe! You know, I'm not a huge fan of G.I. Joe, and you don't have to be to enjoy this game. All you have to do is keep your crosshairs pointed at the enemies and pull the trigger. It's just fun and mind-numbing. I like it. There are only three stages in this game, but the first two are pretty long. You just keep going and going. See that building back there? We'll eventually get to it. See? Now we're closer. Take a moment to notice how tall it is. Now we're going inside. And up, and up, and up. Wow, sure a lot taller inside than outside. Now what the hell's going on here? There are boats and splashes in the dirt, and I guess that's water on the ceiling? Yeah, I think that's supposed to be the other way around. This is one of the reasons I don't like emulation. You just can't trust it to give you the true experience. But overall, this is a great game with cool scaling visuals and cool music. It never came home because I don't know any home system at the time that could handle this, plus it's extremely short. It would have made a great Saturn game for $10, though. G.I. Joe did appear on the NES in a couple of games, but as you can see here, they're side-scrolling platform games and not a port of the arcade. A fun game for sure, and it feels a lot different than anything on a home console. Here's Superman the Arcade Game by Taito. To be honest, I don't think there has ever been a truly great Superman game. Some may have been decent, but never truly inspired. This arcade version is no exception. It's almost as if they didn't really care about it when they were making it. You basically punch and kick enemies in the air or on the ground, and then take off flying upwards and punch and kick more enemies. You fight a quick boss, and then you find yourself playing a horizontal shooter where you shoot down floating rocks with your eyeball lasers. Then wash, rinse, and repeat. There's not a whole lot of variety here with the same enemies again and again, and they have no problem defeating Superman. While you're doing this, you must listen to a horrible version of the movie soundtrack as rendered by Taito's awful sounding arcade board. The graphics are pretty bland too. Just another mediocre game by Taito, of which there are many. Yeah, this game sucks. It's very bland and the action is too repetitive to be enjoyable. Tecmo Knight is a game that I loved in the arcade. I have fond memories of playing this game a lot with a good friend. No, it wasn't Joe because he's just an average friend. The truth hurts sometimes, Joe, I know. Oh yeah? Well ask your girlfriend what or who she was doing back when you were busy playing Tecmo Knight. Then we'll see who's average. You're dirty and low. God. Anyways, at the time I was into gory games like this and even the super awesome Time Killers. It's still a very enjoyable game as you run around beating the hell out of everything until it turns into a bloody pulp or loses its head. You can ride three different beasts in this game, a tiger, a giant, and a dragon. You know, I always like the giant the best because you can jump on top of enemies' shoulders and pound their heads. A straightforward beat-em-up with a special appearance by King Kong every now and again. Once you beat up King Kong's hand, he goes away. Well yeah, he has to grow a new one so he can appear later on. The music is pretty good. Some good melodies for the most part, but also there are some utterly forgettable melodies. This game must have consumed at least $30 of my parents' money back then. Does this kind of look familiar to you right here? Yeah, I'm not gonna really elaborate on that though. <laughs> this game is crazy hard in single player mode because it sends you back when you die. Playing it with two players is really the only way to get anywhere. Overall, it's a decent game, but not likely something I would have played more than once in an actual arcade. Matt Cross Plus by Band Presto is a vertical shoot 'em up. Oh boy, another shooter. Yeah, I kind of get that feeling here too. You choose one of three different ships which shoot bullets, have their own unique special weapon, and can lock onto enemy weak points similar to Galactic Attack. However, this game is nowhere near as good as Galactic Attack. It's not bad, but there's just really nothing special about it. I do like some of the graphics like these layered rocks which kind of remind me of Thunderblade or the scaling ground when a boss takes off for the sky. 
The music isn't bad at all, but it's pretty quiet. Other than that, it's a completely average shooter that's fairly relentless because it really, really, really wants your quarters. Home consoles definitely didn't need any more of these. I really can't tell the difference between this and a lot of the other shooters out there. Although I'm certainly not looking very hard. Shooter fans will like it, but I'd pass it up in the arcade. Yeah, Joe, I'm not so sold on Macross, you know, I mean, it just looks like another shooter to me. So. Yeah, well. I'd like to see, personally, a lot more beat-em-ups like Tecmo Knights. I thought that was great. More beat-em-ups? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, we can definitely do that, but we're going to shove in a few other games in there, too, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, why not? Let's do it. Let's do it. Cadillacs and Dinosaurs by Capcom is a beat-em-up. You'll like it, Dave. You wanted to see more beat-em-ups? Here you go. It's based on a comic book or a TV show or something of that nature. I've never seen either, but you can select from what I'm guessing are four of the characters from that series. You'll notice many similarities to Final Fight, not only because it's a beat-em-up. The game seems to borrow many assets from the Final Fight series that have been reworked for this game. From the characters, to the attacks, to even the bricks in this wall seem to have come from Final Fight. One character looks and moves very similar to Cody, for example. You know, it's okay if Capcom wants to rip themselves off. This game is good enough to overlook that. I like how you have to fight dinosaurs every once in a while. Once you smack some sense into them, they turn green and go on their merry way. Who knew a dinosaur could be calmed down just by beating it up a bit? Capcom knows way more than me, apparently. Yeah, I can vouch for that. The graphics in this game are pretty good. Don't forget the music, Joe, which is actually quite good. It's not the normal Capcom synthesized trumpet arrangement. There's quite a few good melodies in here. Jeez, Dave, I wasn't going to forget the music, okay? It's, it's good. It's good stuff. <laughs> But I really don't know why this never came out to the home system. A game called Cadillacs and Dinosaurs did come home to the Sega CD, but as you can see here, it's an FMV driving game that I guess is based on the same universe or something, but it has nothing to do with this arcade game. And it's nowhere near as fun, either. I really enjoy this game quite a bit. I like the different stages, characters, and enemies. Gate of Doom by Data East is an interesting isometric style game. You choose one of four characters, wander around, defeat enemies and the such, but it seems to stand out amongst other arcade games simply because of its perspective. It does kind of take a bit of getting used to. You have a main attack and you can supplement your abilities by picking stuff up which can make you move faster, have more strength or defense, and cool stuff like that. When the gauge near the edge of the screen fills up, you can use various magic until the gauge runs out. I like the floating Medusa head which turns enemies into stone. The graphics are fairly good in this one. I like this game. The music is pretty good and I like how it develops through the levels. You do kind of flail your weapon around and hope it hits something in its path. It really doesn't give you a great feeling of control, but oddly enough it works. Spider-Man the Video Game is an arcade exclusive by Sega. Sega made a lot of Spider-Man games back in the day, each of them being different. This one starts out as a fairly standard beat-em-up without anything really too special about it. Yeah, where are my spider webs? Well, after a bit, the action zooms out and becomes more of a platform game, which is almost like a poor man's rolling thunder. Here's where you can shoot some webs in a limited capacity. Get past this portion and you zoom back into the beat-em-up action. What's up with the graphics? They're not very appealing and it looks like some of the sprites have been blown up to huge proportions. Oh, so when there's blocky graphics all over a Super Nintendo game, it's okay, but not a Sega arcade game? I see how it is. That's a damn different theme from you. <laughs> That's completely different, and you know it. Yeah, well, I generally do agree with you about the lackluster graphics, Dave, but I've got to admit I'm a sucker for scaling like this, especially back during that time. I like that effect too, but it's not enough to keep me interested. Well, one thing that's almost interesting is that the more quarters you put in, the more life you get. So you can have a huge amount of life instead of simply continuing again and again, though you can do that too if you want to switch characters. This game is okay, not tremendously fun, but definitely worth a try. Not one of Sega's best efforts. <laughs> I would have saved my quarters for something else.
Willow is an action platform by Capcom based on the movie. You run around shooting things and gathering money to spend at a shop to improve your abilities and stuff like that. You eventually even get to be Val Kilmer and he can slash with his sword and jump around level to level like the monkey he is. I've never seen the movie so I can't really say how close the game represents it, but since Val Kilmer is in here I imagine he's probably in the movie as well. Well, I saw the movie a bunch of times. It was highly enjoyable back when it came out. The game follows the movie pretty closely. You even get to see cutscenes with all the characters. This game is pretty fun and it's also extremely tough. Even after you power up your weapon, regular enemies can take dozens of hits before they die. If you want to get anywhere, it's really just best to plow through them as there are a lot of checkpoints in each stage. You're on your own for the boss battles though. The graphics are great and the music and sound are definitely fitting as well. The graphical style and action kind of reminds me a little of Ghouls and Ghosts and the shops definitely remind me of Forgotten Worlds. That's cool because I love both of those games. But when all is said and done, Willow doesn't quite live up to either of them. I really like this game. The control is great and the graphics are really colorful and well drawn giving the game a great atmosphere. I enjoy the game for the most part but the sound effects are too shrill just the way Capcom likes it. Metamorphic Force is a beat-em-up by Konami. You take control of people who have the ability to turn into animals to increase their powers. In fact, it's almost like a super turbocharged altered beast reformatted as a beat-em-up. I really like the pacing of this game. It's fast and fun. You don't stand around forever fighting enemies who have life bars over two miles long, though there aren't really that many different kinds of enemies in the game. At least the game knows I have a short attention span and it respects that by keeping things moving for the most part. A lot of items are dropped by some monkey looking guy and sometimes you take off in a super frenzy damaging everything on screen. There are only two buttons, an attack and a jump, but you can do a special move if you press both of them together, though it takes five points off of your life. There are five stages in the game and you get one life per credit. I think the graphics are great and I love the music. This would have made a great Saturn or PlayStation game, there's really no excuse for this to remain only in the arcades. Yeah, what the hell, why didn't this game get a home console port? The game is very fun and it does have some really well drawn graphics. There's lots of variety in the enemies and even in the backgrounds. The music is just how I like it, good melodies with screaming guitars here and there. R-Type Leo by IRAM is a horizontal shooter just like all other R-Types. Well, actually not exactly like all other R-Types. This one is very upbeat and has a faster pace than the other R-Type games. The first thing I noticed about this game was how smooth the control was. Even at your ship's slowest speed, it feels very responsive. I really like that. You collect similar weapons to other R-Type games, but gone is your droid thingy which you could position either in front of or behind your ship. New are two options which can be charged to attack nearby enemies when you hold the fire button down. It definitely makes it feel more like an offshoot to the series rather than an official R-Type game, but it's still R-Type through and through. It may seem like an easy game at first, but it's not. Now while I didn't die until I got midway through stage 3, I found myself going through the exact same learning curve I went through with other R-Type games. You know, it's every bit as satisfying figuring out the patterns and finally getting into a new area. I really like the challenge here. The game really does give you everything you need in any given situation and you can only really blame yourself if you die. You can't just pop another quarter in to continue your way to the ending. The graphics are really good with multi-layered backgrounds that are a treat to look at. The enemy sprites are great too. However, some enemies and bosses aren't quite as cool as R-Type 1's organic designs. I would have enjoyed this game very much on the Saturn or Dreamcast. This is definitely one of the best horizontal arcade shooters I've played. Yep, definitely a good game here. I felt like I had a great atmosphere and I was drawn in by the great graphics, music, and large player and enemy sprites. I would have definitely played this between a couple of slices of pizza at Showbiz Pizza or maybe even between fights at Chuck E. Cheese's. Golden Axe The Revenge of Death Adder proves that Sega were a bunch of retards in the mid to late 90s. They had this totally kick-ass Golden Axe game eating quarters in arcades all over the world and what do they do? They give us Rusted Axe The Duel! 
Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, and although Golden Axe the Duel was an arcade game, it's a one-on-one -on -one fighter instead of an awesome beat-em-up like Revenge of Death Adder is. They could have brought them both home, not just one of them. Yeah, they chose the damn wrong one, I'll tell you that. I can't believe the stupidity in not bringing this game to the Saturn. It would have been a perfect fit and the Saturn would have had a true Golden Axe game. <laughs> All right, now that I'm feeling better, I can praise the game for what it is. As you can see, this is just another installment in the truly awesome Golden Axe series. There's nothing drastically new here, but that's okay. Well, the characters are all new. I guess the dwarf is in here, but he rides piggyback on some big guy's shoulder. There's also a centaur chick with a horse body and legs, which magically disappear whenever she rides one of the many insect creatures in the game. Now, how does that work? Where, where does all that go? It has great control and you can do this awesome team up move on enemies. Yeah, it causes a ton of damage. A ton. There's new magic spells like this awesome skull breathing death breath that turns enemies into stone. There are no longer multiple levels of magic, but if you collect enough potions, you can use the magic as long as you can. I like the imaginative enemies and the really cool levels. I don't know, some of the enemies seem fairly repetitive to me. Well, yeah, but they're really cool though. The only thing that I don't think is as good as other Golden Axe games is the music. <laughs> don't get me wrong, it's still good here, so I'm not going to be complaining. But not being able to play this game on a home console is definitely worth complaining about. Thanks for thinking of your fans at home, Sega. You ass wipes. And so those are a few of the very many games that never got brought to the home console. Yeah. And Joe, looking at the ones we've talked about, what were one or two of your favorites? Well, you know, Dave, I'm going to have to say Golden Axe Revenge of Death Adder. I mean, it's from Sega. It's awesome. It, it would have been great fun to play at home. And I'm going to have to say R-Type Leo, because that one was awesome. If it had been faithfully translated to a home console, I would have loved the hell out of it, you know. Oh, know, yeah. I, I wouldn't want a bad translation. Oh, of but anyway, anyway, what would you like to see most at home out of what we talked about? Um, well, of course, Golden Axe, the Revenge of Death Adder is the top of my list also. Mm -hmm. I mean, that game just screams awesomeness. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also going to put in there Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Yeah, it definitely. Yeah, I thought uh, Capcom did a really, really good job with that beat em up. I had a really good time with it. Yeah, it's not as good as our type Leo, in my opinion, but I see where you're coming from. So, anyway, what games that were arcade only releases would you like to see us talk about in the future if we cover the subject again? Let us know. And we'll see you next time. All right, Joe, great episode, man. Um, it really put me in the mood to play some arcade games. Oh, so yeah, I'm going to head on down there right now. So. Oh, yeah, have fun. Uh, but I was wondering if maybe I could just borrow some money because I don't get paid till tomorrow. Oh, uh, fine. Have an arcade game on the Joe Meister. With a quarter? Yeah. I'm not having anything on the Joe Meister. <laughs> have you heard of inflation? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah come yeah, on. Sorry. My bad. My bad. My prices have gone up in the last 20 or so years. Yeah, they time. really have. And you know what? They've even gone up a lot more than a dollar is going to pay for. I can't do anything with this. <sighs> You got Fine. some money there. Come yeah, there on, you go. Share it a little bit. Jeez. 20 bucks is good, but you know what? That still only gave me one gameplay. And, you know, I'm a great gamer and all, but I'd have to 1cc that thing, which I can't do. So maybe if I could just grab this thing right here, and I'll see you later. Hello and welcome to GameSack. That's right, it's time to take a look at some more arcade games that were never ported to a home console. Yes it is, and uh, most of these games that we're looking at today were suggested by you guys, so thanks for that. Yeah, a lot, a lot of these games I'd never even heard of before. I wish I had a chance to play them in a normal arcade. Yeah, you're not the only one. Well anyways, enough of that. Let's get on with the show. All right. Osmond is a side-scrolling platformer by Mitchell. Yeah, I've never heard of him either. You control a very acrobatic guy as he runs and jumps around to save the entire world from a deadly cult. Most people compare this game to Strider and there are definitely similarities in the level design and the way the character controls. In fact, the director of this game previously directed Strider. Oh man, yeah, there are multiple times in here where I had an almost deja vu moment and Strider pops into my mind. But really, I see this as its own unique game which shares only a few elements. Osman punches and kicks his way through the levels whereas Strider uses a sword for instance. You also have a special attack you can fire off. 
<laughs> However, I do feel that this game isn't as good as Strider. I feel the overall level design of the game could have been better. It's very hard to avoid getting hit in a lot of circumstances. Also, the enemies in the levels, they're just not very interesting. The game does have some good graphics and the sound is certainly passable, but I think the music could have been better. Overall, I'd say this is a fun game to play, but it's certainly not a AAA title. Aliens by Konami is a side-scrolling running gun, or maybe a walking gun, actually. I had a fun time with this one. Yes, yeah, based on the movie of the same name. Sometimes I can't even tell if I'm playing the game or watching the movie. Everything is just so similar. Ripley even has the same short blonde hair as she does in the movie. Which, I guess they got that wrong. But at least you fight the same purple and pink aliens. Which, no, they got that wrong too. Oh well, at least you can fight in the mechanical lifter. As you're walking, aliens come at you from all over the place. You can shoot a low shot or a high shot with different buttons. There are a few weapons you can pick up along the way. The three-way shot definitely helps. There's no jump button in this game, and I kind of wish there were. There's times when you feel you need to jump out of the way of an alien, but you can't, so you just take a hit because you walk kind of slow. The boss battles are fairly entertaining, as a lot of them are in the background, and you're facing them as you fight. Between the levels, you're riding in a vehicle shooting aliens coming at you. I don't understand the parameters of this, as I couldn't control the speed of the vehicle. I think you're just supposed to shoot things so the vehicle keeps its speed up instead of running into stuff and slowing down. Oh, that does make sense. The music in here is really enjoyable. It's a fun quarter muncher that I think you might enjoy. Dead Connection by Taito is surprisingly enjoyable. Basically, the mob murders your girlfriend and you're not too happy about that. So the only reasonable solution is to get bloody revenge. You play each stage on a non-scrolling screen and your goal is to kill a certain number of people before the time runs out. You can pick up different weapons for better firepower and the environment is very interactive and, of course, destructible. You have absolutely no moral issues with shooting up a hotel lobby or ruining a garden party as long as you're able to shoot a whole bunch of people. You even call it a bloodbath party. Look at that, after you're done you just let the house burn in the background. Gotta keep that anger in your heart after all. The number of people you must kill increases in pretty much every stage and you have absolutely no problem with that since you are one evil son of a bitch. By the time the game is completed you've murdered well over 400 people. The locales all look good and even the music is good. Definitely a joy to play this game as there aren't many out there similar to it. If you like playing as a sadistic detective, then this game's for you. Damn it. Alien vs. Predator is a side-scrolling beat-em-up by Capcom. It's generally a fun game to play, but after a while I just started to get kind of bored. Yeah, that's the curse of beat em ups I think. They've got to be pretty special to retain the player's interest past a few stages. Yeah, I can definitely see the difficulty in programming something like this, but it seems that you're fighting the same aliens over and over, so fighting gets pretty monotonous. In later levels, you actually fight against humans, which helps change things up. Yeah, and here the mechanical lifter even makes an appearance. And you can choose from four characters, two different predators, a man or a woman. I personally like playing with the Predators more than the humans. I agree, but the big guy, as clunky as he is, is pretty tough. The music is pretty toned down for Capcom. It sounds good for the game, but overall it's pretty unmemorable. This is a decent game with a great concept, but I think I'd rather play Final Fight. Next up is Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. Now you may think that this game has a ton of home versions on European computers and the Genesis, but this arcade version is completely different than those. As you can see, this version features an isometric perspective, whereas the Genesis version is a side-scrolling platformer. The goal is the same though, stop Mr. Big and rescue all of the children that you find. 
I guess Mr. Big is building a sinister machine to rule the world and it uses little children as fuel or something, so Michael takes it upon himself to rescue him. You shoot short laser bursts out of your hands to defeat enemies. You also have a super dance move which forces everyone to dance with you, even machines. They just can't keep up with Michael's slick moves, so they die. Rescuing the kids can give Michael more dance moves or extra health. His monkey, Bubbles, appears from time to time and he turns Michael into a murdering metal giant whose heart is as cold as his iron skin. You know, I really didn't like the control in this game. As you might know, I'm not a huge fan of isometric games as they all seem to suffer from aiming problems. It never feels natural to aim your laser or whatever it is at an enemy. <laughs> I can't wait until we talk about Super Mario RPG. Yeah, but that's different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Anyway, the graphics are okay and the music is based on Jackson's music, obviously. You'd think the graveyard scene here would have Thriller, but no, Jackson actually didn't write that song and he doesn't own all of the rights. <laughs> Overall, the game moves pretty slowly and it only has five rounds. Even though Michael was proven innocent, it's still very creepy that he's rescuing little kids. I almost feel the kids are better off with Mr. Big. So which is better, the arcade version or the Genesis version? Well, the arcade version has this. But the Genesis version has this. Wow, both are so awesome. I'm just kidding, not really. Dave, I've talked about three unique games so far. And what have you done? You've only talked about games from the Aliens franchise. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'm not even a big fan of Aliens, Joe. What? <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> yes, well, I'm not. But, but come on, they're good movies. Well, they're, they're all right. I like them, you know, but they're not what? my. I don't have them in my collection. <laughs> Anyways, I've got this great game coming up. What's that? It's called Gun Force 2. Ooh. Here's Gun Force 2, or Geo Force as it's also known. Looking at this game, your first thought might be that it's a Metal Slug clone. Well, the team who made this left Irem and formed a Nazca, who, of course, went on to make Metal Slug. Yeah, even the sounds in Metal Slug were lifted from this game, some of which were even in the first Gun Force game, which was nowhere near as good as this one. So, is this game fun? Hell yes it is! It's loaded with great graphics that have lots of detail. The control is good, but I did have some problems jumping to upper levels and dropping back down to lower levels. It can also be difficult to aim your weapon while running, climbing, and generally getting around. There are lots of vehicles in this game that you can assume control over, just like Metal Slug. The music is generally pretty good. It's loud and blaring just like an arcade game should be. A great game from a great development team that went on to even better IPs. You know, I think I may enjoy this one just a bit more than the Metal Slugs, I'm not sure, but it's pretty awesome. Ninja Baseball Batman is an interesting beat-em-up by Irem. Wait, where's Batman? Well, you are the Batman, attacking enemies with your bat. Yeah, the first time a viewer mentioned we should take a look at Ninja Baseball Batman, I was picturing Batman hitting a home run in a baseball game. I was very happy that wasn't the case. You and up to three friends fight tons of baseball-related things like baseball gloves, baseball bats, and yes, even baseballs themselves. The character designs are just awesome. They kind of remind me of a cross between the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Air Zonk on the TurboGrafx-16. Everything in this game is just so full of energy and you can tell the designers had a ton of fun making this one. For example, you even fight a plane while inside of another airplane and a truck that attacks you with kisses. Honestly, it'd be really hard not to like this game. Fortunately, the game itself is quite fun. Like most beat em ups, it can get a bit repetitive, but this game just has too much charm for me to care about that. The graphics are very colorful and well drawn. The music is strange, but you know, it really does fit the game. This one would have been right at home on the TurboGrafx 16 or the Saturn, and there's no justification whatsoever for not bringing this one out. But it's the best baseball based game ever. So screw you, Tommy Lasorda, I'm playing Ninja Baseball Batman. <laughs>
The cliffhanger Edward Randy is a very strange arcade game, I thought. The background in every stage scales away from you as if you're racing towards the screen. You spend the majority of the game fighting on very small platforms like boats, biplanes, and other vehicles. Your weapon in this game is a whip, and it's kind of frustrating to control, actually. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. Sometimes I couldn't even tell if my whip was making contact with what I was trying to hit. You got that right, Joe. And there's times when you're trying to whip somebody, and you actually end up attaching your whip to a platform, and you start to swing. It's very annoying and can cause your character to fall off the bottom of the screen. You don't die, though, as you have a life bar. Also, the screen never seems to stay still. It's constantly swaying back and forth, and that makes it hard to stay on the platform or time certain jumps. The music is decent and tries to make you feel like you're constantly in an action movie, and there's some repetitive voices too. The game's super short though, and it can usually be beaten in about 20 minutes, so you won't waste a lot of money on this one to get to the end. Yeah, if each continue is 25 cents, I probably spent about two bucks to beat it. Now that's a cheap night out. Overall, it's a fun experience and you could play worse. I can understand why nobody ever ported this one home though. The Out Foxies is a game by Namco which supposedly inspired Super Smash Bros. You choose from seven different characters and your mission is simple. Kill your enemy by any means. Yep, do whatever you can to defeat your opponent within the confines of the stage. The game zooms in and out depending how far apart you and your enemy are. There are random weapons lying all over the place and even the stage itself can be used as a weapon. Yeah, I sometimes had a hard time picking up the weapons. For some reason though, I just couldn't do it on my first try each time. There's also a time limit and the stage will start to crumble if nobody's won after so long. The game has a great sense of humor, especially in the characters. One of them is a chimp who is a contract killer that works for bananas. Another is a pair of twins. You know, it's kind of disturbing playing as two children murdering other people, but okay. It can get really hectic, especially in the stages like the circus where there are tons of other stuff going on. The scaling is cool, but honestly it detracts from the game for me since it's constantly going in and out and it makes it really hard to keep track of everything. I often can't even find my own character. I think this is a cool game though, but it should have spent a little bit more time in the planning stages as the zooming in and out kind of detracts a little bit for me. Well, I thought this game was really fun. I had a great time running around trying to kill my enemy. Gun. Gun. Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa is a game based on an animated TV series. It wasn't very popular as it ran only two seasons before it was canned, but somehow it got an arcade game in the form of this action platformer. Right away you can see that it's a fairly fun game with lots of bright colors. The control is really good and the music is fair for the game. You know, it reminds me a lot of Sunset Riders, and I'm sure the game uses the same engine. But hey, that's a good thing, right? No, no, you are right. But I really wasn't attracted to the characters at all in this one. The only thing that attracts me to a cow is a nice steak or hamburger. I have no idea why anyone would have thought this would be appealing. Anyway, throughout the game you're shooting tons upon tons of cows or bulls, I guess, is more like it. You can get power-ups and special type weapons by shooting birds which drop them when they die. This game has a ton of action, but it does derive most of its challenge by throwing a ton of enemies at you. And the boss fights are crazy because each boss has what appears to be a small life bar, but they take about 100 shots or more before they die. Overall, it's a fun game, but doesn't hold any interest for me because the characters are boring. I'm sorry, but cows and bulls are just boring no matter how human you try to make them look. <laughs> I was able to get past that, just like I'm able to get past Mickey being a filthy rodent in Castle of Illusion. This is a good game, and I think it would have found a nice home on the Super Nintendo. Well, there you have it. Ten more arcade games that nobody cared enough to bring home. Well, I would have cared if they brought some of those home, especially games like Ninja Baseball Batman. <laughs> yeah, that was But awesome. anyway, thanks to your guys' suggestions, we have enough games to probably cover two more episodes like this. But if you know of a game that was left in the arcade, let us know anyway. And if it's not on our list, we'll add it. That's right. We love those arcade games. Yeah. And speaking of which, maybe we could do an arcade to home conversion again sometime. Oh, arcade versus home conversions? Is that like or two home versions? Yeah, yeah, comparing the console to the arcade. Sure. Okay, well, yeah, we should do one of those again. <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching GameSack, and we'll catch you next time.
hey Joe, come here for a sec. I got, I've got some new ideas for maybe some shirts we could wear, some new logos what, and uh, what's wrong with mottos these? or something. Uh, no, no, nothing's wrong with these. I actually really like these a lot, especially okay. this Nintendo one. This is the best. <laughs> come on. But anyways, I've got a couple ideas. Let me just show you. Just kind of just wait here. I'm gonna go in the other room and put the first one on. Okay. You know. Okay. And tell me what I, what you think. I'll, so. I'll just wait here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll be right back. All right, here's the first idea. Okay, that looks very cheap. Uh, support our sack. Game sack. I don't know, Dave. What else you got? All right, number two. My sack, your sack, game sack. You have anything else, Dave? All right, this is my personal favorite, Joe. Look at my sack. Game sack. I don't know, Dave. Uh, and what do you think? I, I, I like them all, but let's let the viewers decide. Hello and welcome to GameSack. We are once again talking about games that were in the arcades and they were never ported to a home console ever. And you have stuff to say about that, don't you? <laughs> I do. It's kind of a bittersweet episode because it's great because we get to actually do a show topic on this, but mm -hmm. it sucks because none of these games came home to mm -hmm. my Super Nintendo. So. <laughs> Indeed. But you can play them on MAME as we yes. are doing here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, I'm going first. And... <laughs> Let's get to it. We all remember DJ Boy, right? Of course we do. It was everyone's favorite game of all time. Okay, maybe not, but it was okay. You basically just played as a hip and happening dude beating people up while roller skating. It was even ported to the Sega Genesis. But Kaneko made an arcade-only sequel called B-Rap Boys for one to three players. This is a crazy beat-em-up. As far as I can tell, your main goal in life is to rap. But then these fools bust through a billboard and, well, you ain't having none of that. That must have been your favorite billboard or something because now you're chasing them on your bike and you're beating the crap out of them. Yep, each and every one of them until they are dead. This game is a lot more fun than DJ Boy. It's especially fun when you're on your bike fighting the bad guys. And when you get knocked off your bike, you're back on your trusty roller skates to kick ass DJ Boy style. I wonder how he rides the bike with the roller skates on. Oh well. But being more fun than DJ Boy isn't really saying a whole lot. One thing that frustrates me about this game is that there are so many enemies on screen at once and they all take seemingly a hundred hits to defeat. They surround you so it's hard to get a kick in edgewise. I think if they had life bars it would probably be a bit more tolerable, but as it is now you have no idea how much damage any enemy has taken and they take a lot. I feel that they could have refined the gameplay a bit more in this area. And you had better make sure you defeat every single enemy before you try to advance, otherwise you can get stuck because the screen often won't let you scroll back to get them. Apparently they didn't test their game very well. It seems to me like there probably isn't any more than 10 different enemies in this game, not counting the bosses. Also, I sometimes find that it's tough to turn my character around and instead I moonwalk. This makes it tough to target the character that I'd like to attack. I really do like the graphics for the most part as they're a huge step up from DJ Boy. The music is full of early 90s style rap. Not licensed stuff or anything, but original rapping for the game. I've got to admit, it is kind of catchy and it definitely helps raise the energy level. Probably not something I particularly want on my iPod though. It probably never came to a home console because DJ Boy sold very poorly on the Mega Drive and the Genesis. Battletoads was released in the arcades in 1994, and this would actually be the last game in the series. There's lots of blood and cruel deaths in this game, which makes this the most graphic version of Battletoads I've ever seen. Actually, I don't mind this, as it's not over the top, and most of the deaths are given out to rats, who nobody likes, and big fat pigs, who probably wouldn't taste very good anyways. The game has some really long levels, and the action is non-stop. This game was developed by Rare and actually was released by Electronic Arts. You choose from one of the three Battletoads with the always great names of Pimple, Zitz, or Rash. Or if you're lucky enough to have two friends, you can play three players. 
Chances are, though, you'd find this game in an arcade before you're able to find two friends. I'm proof, and as you know, Joe is my friend, and I really don't have any others besides him. Don't pity me, though, because I'm okay with this. Well, I'm not okay with it. Anyways, it's a fun Battletoads game where your fists, feet, or head turn really big when you land a huge hit. I really like the scaling enemies as you kick their butt towards the screen. I never get sick of seeing this. This game boasts a whopping six stages, and for the most part, they're straightforward beat em up levels, except for the last stage. In this stage, you have a gun and are sadly stuck on the back of a small spaceship for the entire level. The music is pretty enjoyable, and it's even catchy at times. I'm guessing that Battletoads ran his course, and that people felt they put as much money into the property as they were willing to, and that might be why we never got a home release. It's a great game that should have been brought home somewhere, and who knows, maybe it will come home to some sort of virtual console someday. Mystic Warriors is an oriental run and gun by Konami. In this game, ninjas are on the cusp of conquering the entire world. I don't know, that doesn't sound so bad. Ninjas are pretty cool, right? Well, some of the bad ones capture your fellow ninja friend and you've gotta rescue his wimpy ass. And you guessed it, this game uses the same arcade hardware as Sunset Riders. You can have up to four players at the same time. Man, things get chaotic enough in single player, I can't even imagine what that'd be like. Plus, I only have one friend, so what am I gonna do? You can choose your character when you start the game or continue. Each of the four characters, well actually five characters, seem to have the same abilities from what I can tell. One might be faster or slower than another, but I was hard pressed to tell any significant differences. You can power up your shots by opening certain boxes. These boxes also contain screen clearing attacks or give you a temporary shield. You can even replenish your life and get bonus points from these boxes. The boxes are your friend. Basically, the game plays almost exactly like Sunset Rider, so you know it's awesome. It gets quite addictive as well, and I always want to continue when I die. The graphics are done in kind of a cartoony style with lots of vivid colors, and everything is really well drawn. There's plenty of parallax scrolling and a bit of scaling here and there. I like how in the beginning of this stage you can see the plane crashing in the background that you were just fighting on. I love little details like this. You just look at this game and it makes you want to play it. Or at least it makes me want to play it, but I'm already playing it. The music is excellent. It has a very Asian flavor to it. I mean, it would if you could taste music, I guess. The sound quality overall is also excellent. The bosses are kind of chatty and they say goofy things before you fight them. My rocket is the best. No. <laughs> this is a great game and I'm not sure why Konami never brought it to a home console. It's too bad, too, because I think the world could always use more Sunset Rider style action. Bucky O'Hare is a great game by Konami released in 1992. This one is a beat em up, and it's completely different than the NES version that you may be familiar with. The game plays similar to the other beat-em-ups by Konami at the time, like Turtles, X-Men, The Simpsons, and all of those. If you don't know who Bucky O'Hare is, that's alright, because he's kind of obscure. He was a comic book character in the late 1970s, and had a one-year run as a cartoon in 1991. But what's important is that this is a great game. You can play as one of four characters in your attempt to beat up and destroy all the Toads from taking over the Anniverse. Eight long levels are here for your enjoyment, and they all play fairly similar for the most part. The graphics are super colorful with lots of nice detail. There's not a lot going on in the background graphically, but you know what, that's alright as you don't want to be distracted from the waves of enemies being constantly tossed at you. In between levels, you're treated to some really cool cutscenes that piece the story together and they're all done by the original actors from the cartoon. No fly sucking slimy croaking piece of sludge toad is taking over planet punk! I really like the music in this game and it has a nice space adventure feel to it. A fun little fact is that most of the game designers went on to be part of Treasure who, as we know, have released lots of quality games. I'm not sure why this game never got a home release. Turtles 4 worked really well on the Super Nintendo, and this could have been another great beat em up to go alongside that one. Sadly, it was never meant to be, so it just ended up being shown on a lame ass episode of GameSack. Blood Brothers is an interesting game by Tad Corporation. Remember Tad? 
In this game, you stand on a single screen shooting down anything that moves. Cowboys, Indians, horses, pigs, it doesn't matter. The environment is all extremely destructible and it's really easy to bring down entire buildings. Your goal is to simply kill enough bad guys to deplete the foam meter at the bottom of the screen. You have four scenes per stage and the fourth scene has a boss fight. You have a shot button, a button to lob grenades, and another button to roll in order to dodge enemy shots. You can get weapon upgrades and all that sort of good stuff. It definitely ramps up in difficulty quite a bit once you get to stage two or three. So yeah, it plays very similar to Cabal, which I'm sure some of you have played. Okay, maybe a lot of you. It's made by the same people, so I guess that should be no surprise. Anyway, you're supposedly trying to hunt down some big outlaw, and in order to do that, I guess you need to destroy entire towns. I don't know, to me it seems like you're on a rampage to kill and destroy, and the good townsfolk are just trying to defend themselves and their town. But you're just hell-bent on killing them and destroying everything they ever built. Yeah, to me, that just feels more right. I think my favorite part of the game is when you win a stage and you run off into the distance. You're just so damn happy that you destroyed everything and you get to go and destroy something else. The graphics are good and I like the details in each scene and how much of it can be damaged by your shots. The music is okay, but it rarely changes and it sounds pretty wimpy for an arcade game released in 1990. I really did have a good time with this one and it probably didn't come to a home console because they thought people wouldn't have been impressed since it didn't have any fancy scrolling, but who knows? I like it more than I like Cabal, I'll tell you that. Alright man, those were some five awesome games that would have been kick-ass on my Super Nintendo. <laughs> Those were some five <laughs> awesome games, but I think they would have been highly compromised. Yeah, the they Nintendo. probably would have been a little bit On the Sega Saturn, however, I think they would have been yeah, really, true. really good. Yeah, that's true. I would have played them on the Saturn. Yeah. Anyway, we've got, well, we've got five more, so don't go away. Here's Hook by Irem, which is based on the movie of the same name. There's lots of home console versions of Hook by Sony Imagesoft, but this one is a bit more fun than any of those. It's your standard arcade beat-em-up, and I really had a fun time playing this game. You know, I was never a really big fan of the movie Hook, but I really liked the Peter Pan animation by Disney. Being that they're based on the same character and story, they obviously have lots of similarities. In this game, you can choose to play as Peter Pan, Rufio, or three of the Lost Boys. All of them play the same, but have different attacks and special animations. You know, Peter Pan should have been the only playable character. Why would you want to play as anyone else? They're probably there for multiplayer. I feel sorry for player two. The fighting is fun, and there are a lot of weapons, treasures, and life to pick up along the way from barrels and treasure chests. I like the spear that you check at your enemies. It looks like it sticks in their heads as it pushes them off the screen. That's awesome. There's some large boss fights here, and of course a battle with Captain Hook, and you know what, he's just as you would expect him to be, a cowardly, dirty fighter. Even Mr. Smee is here, that blithering idiot. It's a good looking game with some decent music which makes me wish this game came to a home console. I'm not really sure why Irem didn't bring this one home, but if I had to guess I would say that the game wasn't popular enough to spend the time and cash on a home release. Also, Sony probably owned the rights to any possible console versions. Boogie Wings by Data East is a really cool game that came out in 1992. At first it appears it's just a horizontal shooter with a biplane that takes place maybe around World War I. That in itself is pretty cool as most shooters simply have you flying around shooting things in space. But no, your plane has a grappling hook and you can pick up bombs and other objects and hurl them at the enemy. You can pick up almost anything, but not everything causes damage. Some things can cause a ton of damage like picking up tanks and tossing them into the bigger enemy. Also, if you press the fire button quickly, you generate a lightning bomb type of weapon that briefly envelops your plane. If your plane gets hit, well, you're not done yet. You jump out and continue on foot like the total badass that you are. You can run every bit as fast as you were flying and jump almost just as high. Your sprite is super tiny and for some weird reason, I kind of like this. As you're running around, you can still shoot your gun and also jump into many different vehicles or even on a horse. It almost reminds me of Metal Slug, but with teeny tiny sprites instead. You can even get on a pogo stick, but that doesn't last long. The game doesn't take itself seriously at all, and I always like that in a game. God, I miss Data East. I really wish they were still around. The graphics are great, with tons of small details everywhere, like the Blues Brothers? Or how about this little dog that's following you around and it can't be destroyed? 
I love stuff like that. Everything is really small, but again, there's something really appealing about that for some reason. And no, get your mind out of the gutter. I'm not making excuses for myself. Leave me alone. The music is great too. I probably wouldn't listen to it outside of the game, but you can tell this game is all about having fun. The music is just so happy while you're blowing the crap out of everything you see. This game really should have come out on a console because it was unique and there wasn't anything really like it. I've no clue why it didn't. Companies had no problem releasing shooter after shooter where you just fly over a boring black background, so why couldn't we get more unique stuff like this? So, if you can, please go back in time and convince Data East to bring this out on the Saturn. Thanks. Here's a nice little beat em up by Data East called Night Slashers. This is a great zombie apocalypse game that came out way before zombies were cool. You can choose from three different characters, but I think my favorite is this vampire hunter guy. I like his moves and he seems a bit quicker than the other characters. Speaking of moves, each character has their own melee attacks, special moves, and super special moves. These are all great, but as is the custom with arcade games, using your super special moves will drain your life bar. This of course makes you dump in more quarters. These special moves work great in upper levels when you're being swarmed by enemies and actually can save your life even if you have to give up some. There's not a ton of different enemy types here. There's lots of zombies and just plain evil people as well. Graphically the game is pleasing. There's some nice level designs, characters, and enemy sprites. I like when you defeat some of the boss characters and their skin melts off of their bones. This is a really nice touch. I also like when enemies turn into a pile of goo. <laughs> it's these little additions that help make a game feel more complete. What's interesting is that the Japanese version which I'm playing here has lots of blood in it. The US version just has green slime because we just can't handle blood in our games. The music is really enjoyable as well. It has some really eerie melodies all with a good tempo. I only have a few complaints about this game. Firstly, when you pick up an item, I really, really hate the off-key whistle that accompanies that action. I just can't believe they couldn't have found a better sound effect for that. Secondly, whenever you're button mashing and fighting an enemy, you can't just stop at any moment. You need to wait before you can turn around and attack another enemy who is coming up behind you. This happens in a lot of games, and you know what, it's really annoying. Other than that, this is a really fun game and it would have been a great one for our Halloween episode. Why Data East didn't bring this bad boy home to consoles is a crime. Delicious. Nitro Ball is another unique game by Data East. This one is an overhead run and gun that looks kind of like Mercs and is also a pinball game? Yeah. The pinball part doesn't happen very often though, so it's mostly a run and gun. The game has a very Smash TV feel to it. You're on a game show and as you shoot certain things, they spit out prizes for you to collect. There are a total of five different areas based on certain themes. For example, the first area is called Strange Football, where everything is football themed, only strange. Then there's also the combat field, Ghost Town, Aliens World, and the Space Station. Between rounds, you have what they call a match chance. If you time your button press and match the red number, you get to play a bonus round, which you basically just run around shooting things to collect more prizes. And like real TV game shows, each level ends in the boss fight. The action is pretty fast and intense, and it really takes a lot of skill not to get hit. It's definitely a quarter muncher, and you'll be dying quite a bit. I like all of the different weapons you can collect. They can make things easier, at least temporarily. Sometimes the game will give you a goal like destroying all the tanks within 10 seconds. If you can do this, then you get even more prizes. Oh, you know the IRS is going to be up your ass over all this stuff. I think my favorite stage is the ghost town, mainly because I like that kind of stuff, and the boss is really cool too. The graphics are all pretty good and the screen is vertically oriented, though I don't think it's necessarily needed in this game. The sound and music are both great. If it exists, I really need to get the soundtrack to this one. With only five stages, the game is pretty short. I was able to beat it in less than 20 minutes, but that was with constant continuing. Probably the best thing about this game is that if you win, you get to be president. What other qualifications could you need besides winning a TV game show? This would be a good game to have on consoles, but I think it needs to be a bit longer. Wow. 
Thundercross 2 is another great shooter by Konami. As far as sequels go, Thundercross 2 delivers in all areas. The first game was pretty good, but it did get a release on the PS2 in Japan, so we won't be talking about that version. Graphically, the game is beautiful, with bright colors and some nicely detailed backgrounds. Multiple layers of parallax scrolling add some really nice depth to each level. The sound is great with some awesome music. It's really upbeat and has that Konami feel to it. Some of the levels have branching paths, which is nice, and it adds quite a bit of replayability. The weapon power-up system is pretty standard. When you first start out or respawn, your first power-up is always an option. The second power-up is always a speed power-up. And after that is the weapon power-up, and personally, I like the lasers the best. You can end up getting a bunch of options for your ship, which is nice. There's also a power-up that makes your options super huge. This power-up has a life bar, and the powers return to normal after it empties. This is a nice touch, but the only thing that I don't like about this is that your options are stationary in this mode. It's not a big deal, but I would have liked to have been able to put my options where I think they would have been most useful. The game isn't super difficult. I suck hugely at shooters, and I was able to do fairly well, and I didn't even die once fighting the level 2 boss. I'm so proud of myself. This is a great shooter that Konami should have brought to the PS2. I guess they wanted to focus on the Gradius series, so we got nothing. And there you go, more awesome arcade games that never came home to the Sega Saturn where they belonged. No, why would they come home to there? I mean, well, if you want to do it proper, you're just going to go ahead and buy the arcade cabinet and bring that into your house. And, you well, know. yeah, uh, if I had room, I mean, if I had like mm -hmm. more than a studio apartment, maybe. Well, yeah, but you could always, I don't know, storm in my house and you can come over and play whenever. <laughs> so. well, I guess that yeah. would be an option. That would be an option. Um, anyway, uh, let us know if there's more arcade games that we haven't covered in these three Left in the Arcade mm -hmm. episodes that you'd like to see in a future installment yeah. of this. And they have to be awesome. We don't yeah. want any, like, uh, you know, clacks or something like that. Yeah, so. clacks did come home, though. Anyway, yeah. in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. All right, man, I'm down to my last quarter, Joe, and I'm going to go play me some Pac-Man. Oh, come on, Dave. I've been funding your arcade experience after every one of these arcade episodes, I think, yeah. since we've been making them. <laughs> and it's awesome. I appreciate but it. But I'd like to play an arcade game now. There's, you know, plenty around here I'd like to play, and come on, how about you give me one of your quarters for well, once and I play a game? All right, I guess so, but you yeah. should play Pac-Man. I'm not going to play Pac-Man. What, what do you think I should play, though? Oh, you know what? Uh, play Afterburner. I just played it. The control's awesome. It's just like it came right out of the freaking warehouse. This thing's awesome. Sweet. I'm going to go play me some Afterburner. Yeah, yeah. Hey, that's my quarter, so put my initials in. The buttons don't work. They can't fire. What the hell? Dave told me to play a game that doesn't even work. I've got to get him back. Hello and welcome to GameSack. Once again, we're talking about games that did not have a home console release, but they were in the arcades. Yeah, and another great batch. It's I think we could do tons of these. There's so many arcade games out there that uh, would fit this mold. Yeah, and hell, let's just get right on into it. What I, do you think? I agree. All right. Dynagear is a side-scrolling run-and-gun game by Sammy. In the year 2993, two battling spaceships fall through a time hole that sends them back 65 million years in the past. The evil Gustav quickly turns the dinosaurs of the planet against you. There's also a wolf-like clan that gets involved and wants to get Gustav off the planet so it can return to normal. As you start the game, you choose from two characters. Roger, who was battling Gustav in space, or a wolf from the planet where the two ships crashed. Both of these characters control fairly similar, with slight differences in their speed and jumping attributes. Honestly, you won't really notice a big difference between the two characters. 
As you'd expect, every level is filled with these dinosaurs who have been turned evil. Man, Gustav must have talked some serious trash about you to get these dinosaurs all riled up. I guess I'll overlook the fact that they have so many different dinosaurs from different eras at once. I'm sorry, but the Stegosaurus was not around at the same time as the Tyrannosaurus Rex. And neither of those were around in the same era as the fire-breathing pterodactyl or the floating, enlarging Cytania. Duh. I mean, anybody knows that. You learned that in first grade. Anyways, as you fight your way through each level, you'll come across many treasure chests. These mainly hold different weapons. Most of the weapons you find are effective, but I found the ball and chain to be the most fun to wield. It's fun getting that thing going top speed and just pummeling enemies. Most of them are just pushovers and will die pretty quickly. The problem is that they simply disappear and have no chance to become fossil fuels for my car in the future. The bosses, on the other hand, are not so easy, and that's probably why they're bosses. It's really hard to get your timing down while fighting a boss. When your weapon goes on auto and you can't really control it very well, that's when a boss seems to get you. It's really hard to keep from button mashing, but you've got to slow down a tad and learn the pattern for each boss. But that doesn't mean you'll be safe. I died many times fighting these bosses, but it didn't matter as I had another continue ready to go if I needed it. After fighting a boss, you'll be able to collect coins that are way too big for anybody's pocket. I honestly don't know where the dinosaurs were holding coins of this size. And did dinosaurs actually have currency? At first glance, I thought they were coins of the Mortal Kombat logo. But there's no shops to spend these in, you just collect coins for points. And of course, points are only important if you're going for a high score. The game flows fairly smooth and you do have a double jump feature which can help in sticky situations or if you have a chance to get up higher. You can also climb walls and fight while you're on the wall. I like this feature. Be on the lookout for places to climb as several levels will have branching paths you can take. I also like the graphics in this game. The backgrounds are quite detailed as are the sprites. I like how when you kill some dinosaurs in the first level they turn into skeletons. All the dinosaurs really do look pissed off so you won't feel bad about killing them. Playing this game I don't feel too sad that it didn't make it home from the arcade. But it still was a fun experience. What would you guys think? Would you like this on a home console? This one's called JJ Squawkers, and it's from a company called Athena. The game starts out with some vandals throwing rocks and things at your house while you're sleeping. Well, you're not happy about this at all, so you're on a mission to destroy pretty much everything you see. You're a bird whose name is, of course, JJ Squawkers. Actually, it's Annie, but I call him JJ. You throw tomatoes and other types of shots to take out your enemies. You can shoot up and down as well as left and right, kind of like ghouls and ghosts if it was on crack. You can also jump, of course, and the game has a very quick pace to it. Actually, the entire game is off the wall crazy. I mean, just look at some of these backgrounds. They're completely nonsensical. Some of your weapons are pretty crazy as well, like this slinky type thing with shoes on it that walks across horizontal surfaces. This is actually my favorite weapon to use. You can also power up each weapon if a certain item is dropped, which it rarely ever is. You can take multiple hits per life thanks to your life bar, which is something that's pretty rare to see in an arcade game. When you actually do die, you sound like a cat being crushed with an Xbox. Maybe the developers didn't know that birds and cats make different sounds? I don't know. Anyway, when you do die, the game sets you back to a checkpoint which usually isn't tremendously far away. That is, unless you're fighting a boss, then it resurrects you right there. Well, unless you need to continue, then it'll set you back before the boss fight. Unless you're playing two players, then one of you responds right there just as long as the other is still alive. That is unless, wait, I think that covers it. The game itself can be pretty tough since there is so much crazy crap all over the screen at pretty much any given time. There's a bit of slowdown here and there, but it's not too bad. Overall, the game is fairly short and despite its difficulty, you can probably plow through it pretty quick. I feel sad for JJ Squawkers having to live in this messed up LSD world. The graphics are extremely colorful, maybe too colorful. I mean, if you look at this game for too long, you might even get a headache. What's weird is that the first level is so normal looking. Maybe as you progress through the game, you're seeing what JJ is seeing as his sanity begins to slip away. I do like the day to night to day transitions in the first stage though, that's pretty cool. The sound in the music is, it's okay. The music is just kind of there and sometimes it's almost annoying. However, some of the sound effects are cartoony and that makes them cool. So why the hell didn't this game grace home consoles? Well, for one, it likely was not very popular. 
I mean, have you ever even heard of this one? I hadn't until someone recommended that we include it. And even if it was in every arcade in the world, I doubt too many quarters would have been dropped into it. Still, it's a fun game and it does have some unique charm. All right, well, there we go. Um, I don't know, Joe, playing these games on MAME is, it's cool and all, but I, there, there's something missing. I don't know what it is. Something's just not feeling like the original arcade. Well, that's because you're playing on an emulator, my friend. <clears throat> yeah, so. that's true. Maybe maybe if I got a arcade stick, USB might, arcade stick. Might help a little bit, but I don't know. Anyway, let's just get back into more games. I agree. A lot of you have requested that we check out OutZone. This one is a vertically oriented run and gun game from Toaplan. You've got two, count them, two different weapons to choose from. I don't even know if I can count that high. Anyway, you'll come across C icons and this will let you switch between your two different weapons. One is a purple shot and you can shoot in any direction. The other is a three way spread, but unfortunately your character completely forgets how to turn around when using this weapon. So basically the weapon system was designed with trade offs in mind. Personally, I like to stick with the three-way shot as much as possible as I feel it helps defend me much more. You also have a limited number of bomb blasts which clear the screen. Oh, and you also have a constantly depleting energy meter. If you let this run out, then you'll slow down, stop moving, and fall over dead. Fortunately, this is extremely hard to let happen since there are so many E icons all over the place which replenish your energy. Just be sure to grab them when you can and you'll be fine. The goal of this game is really more about staying alive rather than just killing everything. I say that because it's extraordinarily easy to die. Since your character is a complete pansy, he explodes when getting hit by any single bullet. Why he doesn't invest in body armor is beyond me, especially when he's heading into such insurmountable odds all by himself. Or with a friend in two player mode! And oh man is the enemy relentless. Many of them will hide behind corners waiting to shoot you as you walk by, but you can't turn to shoot them because you're carrying the three-way shot. Not like it'd matter much if you could anyway, because there's usually another enemy over somewhere else that'll take you down. In these situations, you really just need to use your bomb to clear the area. Fortunately, there's lots and lots of checkpoints. In fact, usually whenever you see a C icon, there's probably gonna be a checkpoint right there. If you run out of lives and need to continue, they're gonna send you a lot further back though. There's also SP icons that'll pop up once in a blue moon. These can range from a shield which lets you take an extra hit to different weapons like a flamethrower or a spinning ball thingy that's pretty cool. The boss fights can be interesting. Often you'll be tempted to use the bomb to defend yourself from the incoming bullets, but that's probably not gonna harm the boss. That's because their weak point is only exposed for a second or two every once in a while. But if you use the bomb when this happens, then you're gonna make short work of him, no problem. Then you just keep on walking as the entire game is just one single scrolling screen. It's awful nice of the enemy to pack everything into a convenient area that doesn't vary more than 20 feet or so in latitude. The graphics are fairly nice though, really nothing too far beyond the capabilities of the game consoles at the time. The music has some nice melodies here and there, but the sound of this particular FM synth is kind of abrasive. It's not too bad though. I'm surprised this didn't come out for any home consoles in Japan. And if it had, it would have never been released over here because companies wanted to give us stuff like Green Dog instead. Overall, it's an interesting take on the run and gun genre that's definitely worth a play. But wait! Two years later, Toaplan came out with Fixate, which is a spiritual sequel. The gameplay here is the same basic concept. Two different weapons with the spread being locked forward. Instead of C icons, you now have a rainbow square. Walk across this and your weapon type switches. But you can walk across the same square again and again if you want to keep switching your weapons back and forth. This one lets you select from eight different characters, but they all play more or less the same, even though their weapons are slightly different. There's now question mark icons which will give you something random like a speed boost or a special weapon. You still have your bomb blasts, but this time they only clear the path in front of you instead of the entire screen. Some parts of the game even play like a vertical shooter. 
These parts are really only okay. And when you die, you respawn right there instead of back at a checkpoint, so this game is much, much easier. Despite coming out two years after OutZone, the visuals look much more grainy and far less refined, I think. In fact, I'd say it looks more like an earlier rather than a later game. There seems to be a lot more slowdown as well. I wonder if they lost a lot of their good staff before they started work on this. The audio is pretty bad, but I'm gonna chalk that up to bad emulation. As someone who owns some arcade PCBs, I can safely say that MAME has never really been on the forefront of accurate arcade sound emulation. Anyway, when it comes down to it, I'd probably rather play OutZone over Fix8, but you should try them both. This is Kengo by Irem. The game starts out with you witnessing the bloody murder of some woman, most likely your significant other. Your character arrives a moment too late to save her life. From here on out, it's quite obvious that you're out to get revenge for this woman, whoever she is. The game looks like a lot of other ninja-style games out there. At first glance, it looks very similar to, say, Revenge of Shinobi, but maybe that's just me. Your character has a sword for a main weapon. You can hold down the action button for a couple of seconds, and this will give you a powerful blast from your sword. It will also defend you from weak attacks from enemies. The attack is actually very handy and does a lot of damage, so you'll be using it a lot. If you don't, then it's going to take you a hell of a long time and a lot of lives to defeat bosses. Enemies come at you constantly, and mowing them down with your sword feels good. I do miss having some throwing stars, and these would have made the game a touch more enjoyable, I think. One thing that I don't really like in this game is jumping. Instead of having a dedicated jump button like normal games, you jump by pushing up. It works fine, but damn, I'd much rather push a button to make my character jump. In each level, there are breakable items such as lanterns and boxes which will give you health and money. Health is a must-have as this game is tough. It's tough because you really do take a lot of hits, and every time you get hit, it takes a lot off your life. Either way, you'll be dying a lot, and that's okay because this is an arcade game and you're meant to die a lot and keep pushing quarters into the cabinet. Throughout each level, if you waste too much time killing enemies or gathering hidden goodies from breakable items, an arrow will come up telling you to get your ass moving. I've got to say that this is the most annoying part of this game. It seems that this stupid arrow comes up way too quickly and you don't have a chance to scavenge for treasure. Did they really think that the player won't figure out that he needs to keep moving? Every level you fight in has a mid-boss and a final boss. Once defeated, the mid-boss will usually drop a sword power up. This is great and helps a lot while it lasts. The problem is that once you take a hit, it's gone and you're back to your basic sword before you know it. Boss battles are tough and I died many times fighting bosses. The combination of pushing up to jump and trying to avoid these bosses makes the game difficult. I really do like the level designs in this game and they all feel like feudal Japan which is what I hope the developers were going for. I also like the explosions after you defeat a boss. The more explosions, the better. I'm surprised it didn't show up on the PC engine since IRM loved porting just about everything there, but alas it didn't. To be honest, this game really didn't win me over. Sure it was fun for a short time, but overall it wasn't enough to keep me interested. What do you think about this one? Finally, we have Bonk's Adventure arcade version from Kaneko. That's right, Bonk got its very own arcade game. As far as I can tell, this one was only ever released in Japan and parts of Asia. Let me know if you know differently. Right away, you get to select from 21 different stages. This one plays a bit differently than the Bonk that each and every one of us without exception know and love. Firstly, you can't keep spinning in the air. Once you press the attack button in the air, you're committed to landing on the ground or an enemy with your head. Also, the power-ups work differently as you become a bunch of different kinds of things now. Like here, he's Skeleton Bonk. Looks cool, but I really don't know what this means. Each enemy takes at least two hits to disperse, and you can't chain attacks like you can in the home releases. The goal is to basically make it to the end of the stage as fast as possible, and the stages are very short as a result. You can collect the smiley faces, but this time they attach to your head, which is pretty weird and looks even more weird. But think of it as making your head bigger. This can be pretty handy for attacks. It can also be used to block some enemy projectiles. But when you get touched, they all fall off and you need to go and collect them again. And of course, since this is a bonk game, there's lots of footballs, basketballs, and soccer balls around. 
If you like bonk, you like sports, period. I mean, they're like the same damn thing. You carry balls for some extra points, and at the end of the level, you can make a sweet basket, touchdown, or goal. Unfortunately, the game just isn't tremendously great. There's just so much random chaos going on all the time that it's really more of a chore to try to enjoy it. After each third level is complete, you get your choice of one of seven bosses to fight. And as you might guess, I don't really care for the majority of these boss fights. Once again, there's just so much random crap going on that it's really hard to focus on what needs to be done. Each boss needs to be hit 15 times, which sounds a lot easier than it is. They throw a lot of other enemies to attack you, each of which take multiple hits to die. The boss fights just aren't as fun as they should be. After the boss is defeated, you play through three more levels of your choosing. Anyway, the graphics are really, really good with multiple layers of scrolling, excellent artwork, and great color. The music is also pretty good, though fairly quiet in comparison to the sound effects. A lot of it has been arranged from the original games. This is definitely the best looking bonk game out there, but also the worst playing and honestly the least enjoyable. It's no wonder that this never came to a home console because we already had better bonk games there. I appreciate what they tried to do to bring some freshness to the formula, but it just didn't really work. I wonder how much different it would have been if it were made by Red or Hudson. I guess we'll never know. And there you go, there's some more games that did not get a home port. And mm -hmm. you know, some of them almost kind of good. We're yeah, I good. actually, I really liked Trio the Punch. That yeah. was one that surprised me. I just liked how the flow of the game went. It was really fun. You know, why did you get the good game? Mm -hmm. I, mean, <laughs> I got stuck with Bonk's Adventure and, oh my goodness. Because <laughs> I'm the good guy, that's why. Yeah. Anyway, uh, let us know of some more games that did not get a home console port, if you can think of any. Um, well, I'm, there are a lot of them out there. So, And what are some of your favorite arcade games that did not get ported home? And in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSec. Joe, you know how I hate playing main games on my computer? Yeah. Well, this is the answer. We're going to be playing some arcade PCB games. What game is that? It's Party Time Gone to the Diver 2. I hear it has pretty women in it. Let's play! Okay. Man, I hate Tate games like this. Tate? You mean Tate? Whatever. Who cares? <sighs> yeah, I agree. Hey, are you going to let me have a turn? Why? Because you got the last girl naked. Oh, come on! She's hot. <laughs> I like that. Hello, welcome to Game Set. <laughs> this is Left in the Arcade Part 5, if you can believe it or not. I can't believe it, Joe. This is an amazing series of episodes that we've got going on, and I always hate it because I like these games a lot, and I hate it because the games never got released at home. That's, that's why I hate it. That is so. true, and we've got quite a few games to show you that never got a home port on any platform. And with that said, what do I always say? Let's get into it. Yeah, let's get into it. This is Marshall Masters, released by IGS in 1999 in Taiwan and over the next two years in Japan and North America. This one-on-one -on -one fighting game lets you choose from 12 different characters. Right away, I'm taken aback by the fantastic 2D graphics and animation. And really, you should be too. They're very smooth and animate in a similar manner to Street Fighter 3, which was also released around the same time. And the controls are quick and responsive despite the many frames of animation. The characters all look really good. The backgrounds look fantastic, but there's no parallax scrolling. Oh well, I guess not everything needs to have parallax scrolling. Actually, yes it does. 
This game reminds me of both the Neo Geo and also the Capcom CPS2 hardware. It's like the Neo Geo because there are four action buttons, a light and heavy punch and a light and heavy kick. It also has those flickering shadows beneath the characters like pretty much every Neo Geo fighting game ever. But it also seems like the Capcom CPS2 arcade hardware mainly because of the non-square pixels. This game runs at a very high horizontal resolution of 448 pixels wide compared to the Neo Geo's 304 pixels. Actually, the CPS2 is only 384 pixels wide, so this is even more extreme! Anyway, most of the characters control pretty well, but there are some, like Scorpion here, which are downright odd. I guess this adds some charm to the game, but he's not really a character I'd want to spend any time mastering. But the game is fast, and if you want to master anyone, you're going to have to learn quickly, otherwise you're going to get pummeled. The moves and also the special moves are fairly easy and fun to figure out and pull off repeatedly. You've also got stuff like being able to recover from an attack before you hit the ground, or flash attacks where you can push your enemy away when they're trying to beat your ass. These help, but I couldn't always do them reliably. Regardless, I always have fun with this game, even when I'm losing. It's a fun fighting game, and it's probably one that not a whole lot of people know about. I think that if maybe more people played it in the arcade, then perhaps it would have gotten a home port. Unfortunately, it couldn't quite compete with Street Fighter 3. Still, this would have made a great game on the Dreamcast, but sadly for everyone, it never happened. Here's Crime Fighters by Konami, and it was released in 1989. This is a side-scrolling beat-em-up, which is cool since I do like the genre. I also like the stories in these types of games because they're mainly also very similar. You're not gonna believe this, but somebody's been kidnapping girls and it's up to you to rescue them, all while kicking some street thug ass all along the way. The fighting in this title is both good and bad. It's good because your character has some cool moves as he can punch, kick, throw, and use weapons that he's taken from his enemies. But it's also bad because the hit detection is off, and if you're too close to the street thug that you're trying to take out, you can't hit him. Your character also doesn't have a lot of reach when he's fighting, so you have to find the right spot to be in to land your attacks. The other bad thing is that if you're using a weapon that you've collected from your enemy and you get hit, it's gone. It would have been nice if it just got knocked out of your hand and then you could retrieve it, but nope, it just disappears. Another thing that I've noticed about this game is that there's no hidden items like health or weapons in background objects. Usually games of this style have these things, but this doesn't and it feels pretty weird. It's okay though, since the game is still pretty fun without all of that. There's lots of funny things that happen to you as you're playing. Things like getting electrocuted if you happen to touch this neon billboard. Or when you see a hooker in the background and try to talk to her, you get flattened against a wall. These are just a few of the many funny things that I noticed while playing. The game has a sense of humor and it works. And this is good because it's not an easy game. There's times when you'll have lots of enemies on screen and you'll get pummeled left and right and then thrown against a wall and it'll take a long time for you to clear that area. Luckily though, you start off right where you die even if you need to continue. All in all, this is a pretty fun beat-em-up with lots of colorful levels and the soundtrack is surprisingly good at times. I enjoyed this one and you should try it if you can. Here's Battle Circuit from Capcom, released in 1997. This beat-em-up was only released in the arcades in Europe and Japan. You can choose from five different characters and up to four people can play simultaneously. I've got to say that I like this one a lot more than I like most beat-em-ups that never got a home port. This game is just so weird and crazy. Basically, you're all bounty hunters and you're going after... Well, you know what? The story is extremely nonsensical, so just know that you need to beat everyone up. I mean, that works. Each character is based on a color. You've got your normal character with cyber blue here, but honestly, the rest are anything but normal. There's Captain Silver, who's kind of a stretchy guy, and he can even turn into a cannon. Yellow Iris is an animal-like woman who's probably the second most normal character you're gonna get. Pink Ostrich is exactly that, a pink ostrich with a little girl riding her. And finally, there's Alien Green, who appears to be a vicious living plant. Who the hell would hire a friggin' plant as a bounty hunter? Oh well, I guess if he gets the job done. You have two buttons to worry about, your attack and your jump, that's it. 
And really, that's all you're going to need. If you press both buttons at the same time, you'll do a special move which can cause some good damage, but of course that's going to drain your life bar. Fortunately, there's food icons all over the place to help you refill it. There's another move which provides status effects that you pull off by jumping and pressing both buttons and up all at once. This depends on your character, so you might be powered up for a brief time, increase your defense for a bit, get some health back on your life meter, or even increase your speed. And you can usually only do these twice per credit. Also on the ground all over the place are coins and other forms of money. Collect as much of this as you possibly can. In regular games, these would just be for extra points, but in this one, you get to spend it between rounds powering up your character with new moves and effects. It's pretty cool. The game plays well and it feels very fluid no matter which character you choose to play as. I like this a lot as you never feel burdened by bad design or control. Well, I don't know if the plant guy is really fluid, but you know, he works. I often get bored with arcade beat-em-ups due to the repetition, but really not this one. The enemies and the characters are funny even if they don't make a damn bit of sense. The graphics are incredibly good with fantastic colors. The animation's also very nice everywhere you look. To top it all off, the music is fantastic and makes the game that much more enjoyable. It's a tough game, of course, and you'll find yourself dying a lot. It's sad that this was never released for any consoles or even arcades in the US. But since it came out in 1997, it's not tremendously surprising. The Saturn was almost dead by then, and the PlayStation was fully immersed in 3D. Still, I'm kind of surprised that Capcom didn't give it a Japan-only Saturn release utilizing one of the RAM carts. If you can, go to a Japanese or European arcade today or tomorrow and play this one. Or just use MAME, whichever's more convenient. <laughs> Ring of Destruction Slam Masters 2 is the sequel to Saturday Night Slam Masters. It's a very arcadey wrestling game from Capcom which was released in 1994. All of the characters from the first game are back along with some new ones. I do like the character design and the variety in wrestlers. And a lot has changed since the first game. For example, you can't move all around the ring like the original and you're stuck on a single plane like a one-on-one -on -one fighting game. Also, you no longer pin your opponents. After they lose all of their double life bar, it's the end of the round. The game still has a lot of grappling moves, which is what wrestling is all about, but you have lots of punch and kick moves too. In fact, there's even moves you can pull off via Street Fighter style inputs like a fireball or dragon punch motions. Come to think of it, this game feels a lot more like Street Fighter than a wrestling game. It's fine though, because the game is fun. The fighting is what you'd expect from a Capcom game, and that's precise. I really didn't have any problems pulling off moves and had a great time. That is until the difficulty ramped up. The game teases you and lets you win the first round very easily. Come the second round, it's a very different story and your opponent wakes up and blocks and counters a lot of your moves. I mean, you really can't expect an arcade game to be easy, right? It's frustrating, but not to the point where you want to give up and stop playing. Being a wrestling game, all of your matches are, of course, in wrestling rings. Capcom did their best trying to have a lot of variety in the backgrounds, and each character has their own ring, which is nice. But the problem is it's a wrestling ring and not a street fight, so the variety isn't amazing. It's a shame this game didn't get ported to a home system. It's definitely challenging, but at the same time, it's a lot of fun. It's totally worth throwing a couple of bucks into it if you ever see it in real life. Which you won't. ESP Raid is a Japan-only bullet hell shooter from Cave. This one is unique from other overhead shooters in one amazing way. You control a flying human being instead of planes or spaceships. Isn't that incredible? Okay, not really, but it is kind of sort of unique, I guess. This game takes place in the year 2018, so if you live in Tokyo, go outside and look up. You just might be able to witness this game happen live. You get to choose from three different individuals, each with their very own hopes, dreams, and yes, ESP powers. And in order to make those hopes and dreams come true, you gotta blow things up with your ESP. Lots and lots and lots of stuff. Each character has slightly different weapons, but they more or less work exactly the same. You have your normal rapid shot, which you'll spend most of your time using. If you hold this button down, your character will move around a little bit slower, and that will help you navigate through some of the chaos. Kind of. 
The next button over is sort of a limited condensed shot thing that drains the outside meter at the bottom, but it refills almost immediately. The last button can be held down to generate a shield around you, which makes you invulnerable and also gets bigger and bigger as long as you hold it down. And once you let it go, it releases a powerful shot with four beams. You can usually do this three times per life or more if you hold it down for less each time you do it. I don't think there's a way to refill the blue meter at the bottom because I can never stay alive long enough to find out. The easiest way I found to refill it is just to die and get a new life. The game controls well enough, but it's a bullet hell shooter, and that means there are tons and tons of colored bullets all over the place. Your hitbox is super tiny, much smaller than your character, maybe only a few pixels in size. Same goes for the bullets themselves. I don't know where these hitboxes reside in each sprite, but it makes things very confusing when things overlap and nothing happens. It's pretty much the opposite of what you'd expect. I mean, if a bullet touches any part of me, I should die. Or at least take some damage. As a result, I never really understood the appeal of the bullet hell subgenre. I mean, if that's your thing, then yeah, you're gonna like this one. I've gotta say though that I didn't care much for this game at the beginning, but as I got more and more used to it, I did begin enjoying it more and more. In fact, one part I really enjoyed was murdering all of these chipmunk women with my vicious ESP powers. I mean, just listen to them die. The graphics are all really, really nice when you can see them. And by that I mean when the screen isn't covered in bullets. There's tons of detail here that you'll probably never see unless you want to die immediately. Oh, and everything blows up really, really nice. There needs to be more parallax scrolling though. Come on, Cave, don't wimp out on me like this. The music is decent, from what I can hear. And that's hard because the sound effects are all extremely loud and they're constant giving the mayhem on screen. Amazingly, this one never came to the Dreamcast back in the day like you'd expect. It didn't even arrive on any later consoles as part of a compilation. And honestly, that's because it was released in the arcades by Atlas, and there are some issues bringing it home without both Atlas's and Cave's consent. Still, if it had shown up on a home console, would you have bought it? All right, Joe, there's five games that could have easily been ported to a home console somewhere. Yeah, but they, they just didn't. weren't. Damn it all. But we've got five more. Shadow Force from Technos is a side-scrolling beat-em-up that stands out from other games in the genre. In this one- or two-player game, you can pick from four completely different characters. They each have their own attacks and specials, so it's really fun to try them all and see which one you like the best. The game boasts a six button control scheme, which is a lot for a game of this style. There's a jump button, two buttons for weapons, two buttons for kicks, and the most interesting button lets you possess an enemy character. You can take control of a lot of the base enemies that you fight. Not only that, but you'll be shown how to do the special moves of the character that you just took over. This is a really cool feature that adds some depth to what is just an otherwise run of the mill beat em up. And if you don't like the character that you possessed, just push the possess button again and you'll switch back to your normal character. This is also a good way of quickly defeating an enemy. In the beginning, the game lets you pick what level you want to start on and then it takes over from there. All the characters have a decent variety of moves and there's even screen clearing attacks that come in handy a lot of times. One feature that this game has that I like is the ability to block by pushing backwards on your control pad. Another feature that I'm not sure if I like or not is your character always faces your nearest enemy. It's a really good idea but it feels just weird at times since I'm used to facing whatever direction I want to. There's all sorts of items hidden in breakable containers such as health and extra points, but there's no weapons unless your character already wields one. As far as the graphics go, the game looks great. There's tons of color and lots of variety in the backgrounds you fight on. And who doesn't love the huge Technos billboard that takes up over half the screen? I know I love it. I mean, it's Technos. Who doesn't love Technos? The music, on the other hand, feels pretty weak. It really didn't do anything for me and I barely noticed it when I was playing. Still, I had a fun time with this game, so I think you should try it out. You'll be happy you did. Let's check out Guardians from Band Presto. This one is also known as Denjin Makai 2. 
The first Denjin Makai game was released in Japan on the Super Famicom, but the sequel here was arcade only. Obviously, I don't need to tell you that it's a beat-em-up, even though I kinda just did. You can choose from a total of eight different characters, which is pretty damn generous for a game in this genre. The mission here is to defeat your enemies without being defeated yourself, so pretty much just like every game ever. You have three buttons you can press to help you out. One is your normal attack, which is usually a punch or slash type action depending on the character. Then there's a special button, which in most cases will be a form of projectile attack. This depletes your power meter, which is below your life meter. And of course, you also have a jump button. If you press the jump and normal attack buttons together, you get another special attack which damages most enemies close to you. This will also eat up your power meter. The weird thing is, is that even after it runs out, the power meter will recharge itself fairly quick, so you'll rarely be unable to do these kinds of attacks. But the recharge will cost you a sliver of your life bar. Despite this, you'll still find yourself overwhelmed by the sheer amount of enemies on the screen at once, all trying to kick your ass. It can get pretty crowded at times. Finally, each character has a big super special type of attack. There's also items to pick up for points, life refills, and even some melee weapons. The characters you control are all pretty unique, and some, like this guy, are pretty weird. And the boss he's fighting here is just as weird. In fact, a lot of the enemies are weird looking in some way. That's cool though, I like that, it gives it some uniqueness. The visuals are pretty nice, often having lots of parallax scrolling, and you know, that's all I need in my life. There's also fun stuff happening in the backgrounds here and there. Like this guy back there who's quickly painting the band Presto logo on the wall. Or these guys who are precariously balancing cards on a table and then you burst in and ruin their day. Or how about these guys who saw down the tree so they fall forward and crush you. And what self-respecting beat-em-up would be without an obligatory elevator stage? The music is kind of weird and it doesn't really fit the game at all. In fact, I'd say that it brings the overall experience down a notch. It's not bad music, I just feel it could be a lot beefier given the game itself. It's still fun for the most part, and I definitely recommend trying it out if you can. I'm a bit surprised that it didn't get a port to the Super Famicom, but it'd need to be compromised quite a bit if it did. Here's Joe and Mac Returns from Data East, released in 1994. This title strays from the previous side-scrolling games in the series and is now a single-screen platformer in the vein of Bubble Bobble. My first thought was that this wasn't going to be a good game at all. But you can't always trust your instinct because this title is actually very fun. The gameplay is simple. Your character has a club that shoots some fire along the ground. The fire doesn't kill but instead stuns your enemies. If you don't do anything after that, they come back to life but who would just leave a stunned enemy alone, right? Once you walk over to them, you bag them. Then you can take the bag and shoot it across the screen, killing another enemy. If you're good enough and can stun two or more enemies, you'll get them in a big bag that can wipe out a whole platform. It's easy and it's fun to do, and you know what? That's what matters. Every level has a trapped cave girl that you need to rescue. You do this by just walking by them, and they'll be so grateful that they will give you lots of food and points and sometimes a weapon. Make sure you don't hit the cave girl with your club, because they'll push you away and you won't get anything since they don't like that kind of treatment. But yeah, enemies also drop lots of food for points and a lot of yummy sushi. They also drop power-ups from time to time. When you collect it, your cave guy yells out, I got a power! I got a power! These power-ups can range from moving faster, having a bigger mallet, or being able to shoot projectiles. Another interesting feature is an enemy generator that you'll find on some stages. It's reminiscent of games like Gauntlet as it keeps spitting out enemies until you destroy it. And of course, what game like this would be complete without a boss battle at the end of each area? None, I tell you, no game would be complete. The boss battles are fun, but overall pretty easy. Between levels, you're treated to a cutscene that usually involves a cave girl accidentally being liberated from her clothes and the cave guys gawking at her. It's really too bad that this game never got a home release. It's hugely colorful and looks amazing and I would have been all over this game back in the day. Not to mention, the music is really fun as well with lots of sampled voices and instruments. Oh well, I guess if it did get a console release, I wouldn't be talking about it here. Have you played it? Tell me what you think. Yeah. 
This is Pirates from a company called Nix, and it came out in 1994. In this extremely obscure Cabal ripoff, you play the role of a pirate in search of some treasure. Basically, you can run back and forth in the foreground. You have a cursor which you can aim as you fire and shoot stuff. You also have a limited number of grenades you can toss anywhere the cursor is pointed. The enemies definitely fire back at you and you can shoot most of their bullets down before they get to you. But if you can't, the last button is a dash move that will save your hide as you slide right through the bullets unharmed. You'll be murdering tons and tons of people who are trying to stop you from getting the treasure, but hey, this is money so lives do not matter. You have some pretty damn powerful guns too as you can destroy ships all the way on the horizon back there with your little pistol. I mean, damn! There's also some strange stuff that flies in from time to time like this noisy witch. Shoot her and she'll drop an item like an extra bomb. You can also get gun power-ups which have a faster shot and a wider range. And even with all this, you'll still find yourself dying quite a bit. Most of the levels have destructible backgrounds and you know it's always satisfying to watch the homes of innocent people crumble on my quest for the gold. Damn them. In each stage, there's also a slightly hidden bonus prize that's worth a ton of points. And at the end of every third stage, you get to fight a boss and these fights are pretty fun. The graphics and the sound are both pretty primitive for an arcade game released in 1994. This may be one reason why it never came home, because it would have been a huge step backwards to what was already being released on the 16-bit consoles at the time. Another reason might be that publisher Nix was extremely small and couldn't afford to port it. That's okay, because it's not even the best of the Cabal ripoffs anyway. Plus, Wild Guns would be released the following year on the Super Nintendo in North America and the year after that in Europe. So honestly, it's not really a big loss that this one never came home. But if you actually see an operational pirate's machine in real life, give it a play because you probably won't see another. This is Gandara, a two-player vertical running gun game by Bam Presto released in 1995. It seems some sicko out there has taken all the children from a village and you need to get them back safe and sound. The fighting takes place in many different but typical locations like jungles and whatnot. It does make things interesting since you don't do all of your fighting on your feet. The second level, for example, has you riding a motorcycle killing lots of other dudes on motorcycles which is pretty fun. Your character is equipped with a normal gun but can quickly ditch that for something better. In fact, trying out the new weapons was one of the most enjoyable parts of the game for me. There's quite a few and I really haven't found one that I don't like since they all look really cool and do a fair amount of damage. Many enemies take multiple shots to kill and that can kind of slow down the pace a bit. Honestly though, you'll hardly notice it. Besides your normal weapon, you have a special weapon that can be used two times while you're alive. These of course are pretty powerful and can get you out of a tight spot quickly. I always try to save them for boss fights since that's where they're usually most useful. Oh, and there's a third button here that lets you kick your enemies. I'm not really sure why this is here as I never got close enough to an enemy to actually put my foot in their ass. But it's there just in case you want it. Rescuing kids is interesting as they're usually tied up to a 50 gallon drums of who knows what. It's not gasoline, that's for sure, or I would have blown those kids sky high trying to rescue them with my gunfire. And you can't miss them since they all yell mammy or something like that and are all dressed in the same yellow uniform. The boss fights are kind of fun, but they kind of have a slight bullet hell feel to them. The game itself looks pretty good and there's quite a bit of animation to everything that's going on in the background. And the game isn't easy, especially the bosses. If you run out of lives and continue, the game puts you back so you can't just pile in credits to get through this one. It's a fun game, but really I think it'd be better with two players as then we could have more of a fighting chance. All right, there you are, 10 more games mm -hmm. that we never saw at home. And like you, I'm disappointed that the Joe and Mac Returns never came home. That, that was fun. Yeah, that should have been brought home. I mean, that was actually really, really fun. And a lot of good beat-em-ups didn't make it mm -hmm. home. Oh yeah. A lot of beat-em-ups tend to stay in the arcade. What's up with that? Yeah, and then they release crap like puzzle games. Sheesh. <laughs> You like puzzle games. Uh, not all of them, no. <laughs> anyway, what are some more games, you know, going back and checking our previous four Left in the Arcade episodes that 
got left in the arcade that you'd like to see us cover, let us know, and hopefully they're not all like shooters. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I like to include a few shooters from time to time, but I don't want an episode swamped with them because mm -hmm. they're hard yeah. to play, especially for you. Especially for me, <laughs> since I'm horrible at them. But. Anyway, let us know. In the meantime, thank you for watching Game Set. What the hell are you doing? I'm looking through your games here, Joe. I mean, we've done five left in the arcade episodes and I'm afraid we're running out of ideas. So I'm just looking for some games in your collection for some ideas. <laughs> like Daytona USA, did that ever come home? Yeah, I think it did, Dave. Are you sure? Yeah. How about, how about Sega Rally Championship? Now that never got brought home. Yeah, I think that one came home, Dave. How am I supposed to believe you? Because you're holding it. <laughs> I am, aren't I? <laughs> well, how about, all right, how about Burning Force? This never got brought home, did it? I don't think it did, Dave, no. It didn't? No. Huh. I'm gonna cover this one then. This is my first game, so. You do that. All right, I'll see you later. <laughs> you see what I have to work with here? Hello and welcome to GameSack. It's time once again to take a look at some arcade games that were never ported home or included in any compilations. It's been a while since we've done one of these and there are a lot of great games in this episode. But even the ones that aren't so great are still interesting. At least they are to me. Anyway, let's get into it. This is AB Cop or Air Bike Cop from Sega released in 1990. Well, it was published by Sega, but it was actually developed by ICOM, best known for developing Polestar on the Neo Geo and also Mayfat Conspiracy on the NES. Is that how you say it, Mayfat? Knowing my luck, it probably isn't. In this game, you play a righteous policeman on an air bike, dispensing justice as you see fit on the streets which are full of crime. It plays similar to Chase HQ in that you need to hunt down the bad guys and your main method of attack is ramming into said bad guys. During the normal part of the stage, you have a set number of lowly enemy air bikers that you need to kill. These are all marked with an arrow. Simply ram into them and they'll blow up. But each subsequent stage needs you to ram into these guys more and more times before they die. There will be an occasional enemy which seems to take fewer hits though. To catch the enemies, you have a turbo button which works most of the time, but if you overuse it, you need to wait a small amount of time before it works again. You also have a jump button which enables you to clear obstacles and also makes your attack better if you can land on an enemy while using your turbo, but only for that one hit. You can only jump a set number of times, but you can pick up more jumps with the blue J icons. After those guys are all dead, you fight the boss and he shoots stuff at you. You can jump over it, but I suggest that you keep him as close to you as possible. He has a life bar so you can see how effective you are trying to kill him. Actually the bosses don't die, they get to go to jail, unlike all of their minions that you just killed. Speaking of dying, you're invincible in this game. That's right, no matter what happens to you, it only slows you down and it doesn't cause any damage. So, what is the challenge? The clock. It is not generous at all. If it runs out, crime wins and justice fails. You only have one life, so if the timer runs out, you need to continue. And if you do, I like how Airbike Cop thanks the coin for saving his life. The good news is, is that the stage has its own time limit, but if you make it to the boss, he has his own time limit as well, so you can just keep continuing from him. Well, except for the final stage, which is mostly a boss rush with only one timer, so good luck. This game is actually pretty fun and it made me want to keep trying as it is quite challenging. The graphics are pretty good for a 1990 game, though certainly nothing that we hadn't seen before at the time. There's plenty of fast scaling provided by the Sega X board, which is the same hardware used for Afterburner and Thunderblade. Unfortunately, this game never exceeds 30 frames per second, which honestly is kind of surprising. The sound and music are pretty good, and basically it sounds like a Genesis. Certainly nothing wrong with that. I can kind of understand why this game was never ported, as it's quite basic, and by the time we had hardware powerful enough to do it justice, it just didn't have enough content. 
Still, I would have loved to see it on the Saturn bundled with the other Sega games that I'll be talking about in this episode on a single CD. I mean, wouldn't you? Here's Desert Assault by Data East, which was released in 1991. You know, I could have sworn we covered this game in a previous episode, but nope. We were also going to do this for playing with sax using a friend's arcade PCB, but we didn't do that either. Not sure why, as this is a really cool overhead run and gun. It reminds me a lot of Capcom's Mercs. You can choose from four different outstanding human beings in the beginning. Each of them starts out with a unique weapon, but any character can get any weapon. Each character also has a unique bomb style attack as well. Sadly, they all share the same exact voice. You have a life bar, which is a good thing because it's really easy to get hit. One of the things that makes it easy to take damage is how slow a lot of the enemy bullets move. You'd think they'd be easy to dodge, but they hang around on the screen for way too long and not all of the bullets move at the same speed. You can refill your life bar a bit by grabbing food, coke, milk, or things like that. You can even run around by double tapping in the direction you want to run. The weapons are all fun to use, even the shotgun. I normally hate shotguns in games because of their limited range. You can even get in a few different types of vehicles to wreak havoc in, and some of them are huge. That's what she said. There are only five stages here, but they are all pretty big and they seem to get longer and longer the further you get. The good news is, is that you won't get bored playing them. Sometimes there are searchlights that you need to avoid. Getting caught basically just freezes you for a second. Fortunately, it's not a stealth mission like Metal Gear or something. I mean, everyone's already shooting at you anyway, so come on, they know you're here. The graphics are really good with lots of variety and some cool stage designs. Data East also really liked using their single layer transparency effect in this one. It's especially effective when you go into rooms, which allows you to see through the walls. The music is awesome, and that's pretty much the case in most Data East arcade games. You've got some cool synthesizers as well as some real electric guitar. That's right, it's real. Oh my God, is this game from the future? So, how does it compare to Mercs? Yeah, it's pretty close. Mercs feels a little bit better when it comes to the control and as a game, this falls behind, but not by much. I'd also say that Shock Troopers on the Neo Geo is a better game. Still, you can't go wrong here as it's very enjoyable. This would have been a great game to see on the Genesis or the Super Nintendo, though it surely would have had to been downgraded. Or maybe even the Neo Geo since Data East made games on that. Can you imagine the Neo Geo getting a port of a non-Neo Geo arcade game? What a trip that would be. The transparencies would have to go away though. The Saturn or the PlayStation could both do this game perfectly, but by then I guess customers weren't really interested in 2D games, at least according to company executives. Check this one out if you can. This next game has been requested a lot, but I've always had issues capturing the gameplay. Well, thanks to my really big brain, it's no longer an issue. It's a pretty fun game, so check it out. A lot of people request that I talk about Carnival, which is a light gun game from Midway that came out in 1998, and they request it often. Well, here it is. I'm finally getting around to it. You guys hyped this one into the stratosphere, so I expect nothing but the best. Nah, I'm just kidding. Anyway, you're in a group tour checking out some spooky stuff from the token taker's estate, I guess, and he's dead? Since you're an idiot, you take his token and plop it into the jester's mouth. Now the carnival is awakened again and is trying to kill you. Jeez, that's the thanks I get for waking you up. You have weapons somehow, and you need to kill almost everything you see. It plays pretty much like any other light gun game, except that this one is FMV based, kind of like Area 51. However, here it's all rendered graphics with real polygons on top of them. You have a standard ration of six bullets, and at any time you can reload to replenish your capacity. 
If you're like me though, you'll often find yourself shooting at the screen with an empty clip for a second or two before you realize that you need to reload. Keep in mind that my IQ is barely even in the 50s though. Of course, there are various gun power-ups if you're quick enough to grab them, but honestly, they don't last very long at all. My favorite is the extra capacity clip with your basic weapon, which will last until you die. There are four stages, and you can choose the order in which you play the first three, and only after defeating those first three can you see the final level. Each level is pretty big. My favorite one, of course, is The Haunted House. It reminds me a lot of House of the Dead, only a bit watered down and crappier looking if I'm being honest. Still, there's a lot to appreciate in this level. My next favorite is the Christmas theme level. I love all the different music in this one. Then there's the circus level, and if you're afraid of clowns, then it might be scary for you, I guess? Personally, I just kind of think that clowns and circus things are kind of dumb, so I didn't get much out of this level. The graphics are decent, I suppose. The FMV backgrounds are kind of grainy. The polygons aren't much better than Nintendo 64 quality, and their textures are so-so. And since this game is FMV based, the frame rate is pretty low, running at around 18 frames per second most of the time. When the camera moves fast, it can be pretty ugly and you feel like you don't have very precise aim as a result. Compare this with House of the Dead 2 which came out at around the same time and it looks even worse. House of the Dead 2 has a completely polygon world, twice the resolution, and runs at 60 frames per second. Overall, this is still a fun game. I'm surprised that Midway didn't release it on the Dreamcast or the PlayStation 2. A game I've always wanted to play is Arabian Fight from Sega, which was released in 1991. This is a beat-em-up, and right away you can see why people might want to play it. The visuals are incredible for its time. Everything moves in and out of the screen, and it all scales smoothly. All the characters and all of the backgrounds look great. And there are even some really cool animated scenes which look like they hired an actual animation studio to do them. As far as the story goes, it turns out that the princess has been kidnapped and now you need to rescue her. Oh, <laughs> Talk about motivation! That's all the story any video game ever needs, even racing games. Up to four players can play, and that means there are four characters to choose from. Sadly, this one doesn't play as good as it looks. For one, the characters are all pretty big, and it can feel a bit claustrophobic even with just a single player. I can't imagine four players with a ton of enemies on screen at once. It'd be mass confusion. As a result of the tight space, you'll sometimes get knocked completely off of the screen, which is quite frustrating. Anyway, you have a punch and a jump, as well as a special attack, which of course removes some of your life bar. Pretty basic stuff here. But sometimes you'll find a genie lamp. If you grab it, you'll get the option to do your special attack. To do this, you have to press the attack and jump buttons at the same time. It doesn't always work the first time you try it, but when it does, it usually kills every on-screen enemy. Unfortunately, the screen flashes a lot when this happens, and it's super annoying. And what kind of special attack you do seems completely random, but it actually depends on what area you're in. The game is slow, but at least each area is pretty short. Even with this, though, the game does start to get boring, which is something that plagues a great majority of beat-em-ups. Towards the last part of the game, I just decided to stop playing as it was so repetitive I didn't feel like seeing the whole thing through to the end was a good way to spend my time. I think if I were playing with a friend or three, I'd probably put forth the effort to see it all the way through though. It really takes a special kind of game design skill to keep beat-em-ups interesting the entire way through, and that skill wasn't at work here, sadly. Like I said, the visuals are fantastic and obviously the best part of the entire experience. It's not all peachy keen though. The enemy characters move around the screen in a very jerky and kind of unsettling manner. The music is fine with lots of Middle Eastern flavored stuff. The sounds are mostly okay, though I find the noise that most of the skeletons make kind of odd. As of the making of this episode, the video emulation for this game isn't perfect yet. I'm assuming that the sky back there is probably supposed to be blue. I can see why this one didn't get a home port as honestly, aside from the graphics, there's really nothing special about it. The Saturn got Guardian Heroes, which is similar in a lot of ways, but is so much better all around. 
Still, I wouldn't complain if this were on a compilation with lots of other arcade games. This next game has also been requested a great many times for some coverage, but I kept confusing the title with Night Slashers for whatever reason. It's not Night Slashers, but you know what it is? I think it might be my favorite arcade beat-em-up of, well, ever. Violent Storm from Konami is another beat-em-up, this one released in 1993. Now this is how you do a beat-em-up right. You're not going to believe this, but your girlfriend was kidnapped for absolutely no reason. It really doesn't matter. All you need to know is that hundreds and hundreds of enemies are going to die as a result. You can choose from three different characters, Wade, Boris, or Kyle. I really like the energy in this game. Everything moves around quite fast as you fight. The control is excellent and never feels sluggish in the least. Not only that, but most of the enemies die quickly and you're not left hanging out in the same place forever before moving on. This is a great way to make the game feel far less repetitious. There's only a few enemies who take a lot of damage and you can usually defeat them in maybe 45 seconds or so. As expected, the bosses are a lot tougher. What's interesting about these guys is that they have two life bars, a big one at the bottom of the screen and a smaller one near the top where all of the other enemy life bars show up. Seems kind of redundant to me, I don't know why they did that. But I'd just say that I'd rather have too many boss life bars than no boss life bars. Again, this is a standard beat-em-up with an attack button and a jump button. Press them both at the same time and you'll do your special, which, once again, takes off a chunk of your life bar. You'll find yourself needing to do this a lot as you constantly get surrounded, at least in single-player mode. Of course, it's no big deal, since you have unlimited continues, which is actually kind of interesting for a Konami arcade game. Usually they limit the number of continues you can use. The graphics are bright and colorful for the most part, certainly nothing to complain about here. Everything looks a tad cartoony, and that fits the game's high energy level. Then there's the music, which is responsible for 80% of that energy. It's crazy, with three of the stages having super cheesy songs as you fight. There's also some rockabilly stuff, and this game kind of reminds me of playing Ane-san on the PC Engine as a result. As goofy as the music is, it really does make the game even more enjoyable. It makes me feel as if Konami had a good time making this one. I certainly hope that was the case. This is another game where the emulation isn't quite perfect yet. I'm not sure what's off about it though, as I've never played the game in an actual arcade. Overall, this is a fantastic game and I had fun from beginning to end and I can't wait to play it again. I'm pretty upset that this one never came home. This one would have been perfect on the Saturn or the PlayStation. Maybe Konami figured that this game was too old to port by the time those systems came out. It's really too bad. Be absolutely sure to play this one. Okay, for this last segment, I want to mention a few Sega arcade games that never came home, starting with Arrail. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm sure you'll let me know. This was released in 1990 and developed by Weststone. West One? This is an overhead tank game that feels a tad primitive for an arcade game released in 1990. Basically, you pilot a tank and can shoot in eight directions. If you hold the fire button, you can't move, but you can keep moving if you tap the fire button. Over on the left is a power meter. When this is blue, you can press a button to wrap a shield around you. In order to fill this meter up, you need to collect P icons. Even if you already have a shield active, you can activate another one if you have enough power, and once the first shield takes a hit, the second one is automatically there for you. You can also get a little option thingy which orbits your tank, but it doesn't feel very helpful most of the time. It is still kind of helpful though. Eventually, you'll work your way inside and the view changes to a first person mode. 
Here you just need to shoot down enemies and collect P icons. Make it through that and now you're at the last part of the stage, working your way to the boss at the top. This game is tough, like crazy tough. It would take a lot of dedication to get far in this one. You often stand no chance at all with enemy fire coming at you from multiple directions all while you're trying to shoot those same enemies down. You're constantly looking for more P icons just so you can have enough shield to survive. Weirdly, the first person tunnel segments are extremely easy. The graphics are fairly good, but you probably won't see much of them. Same can be said with the music. I think the reason that this one never came home is because it wasn't very popular, likely because nobody wanted to spend 20 minutes and a ton of quarters just to get past the first three areas and defeat the first boss. Next up is F1 Exhaust Note, which was released in 1991. As you can see, this is a dual screen F1 racing game. Honestly, aside from the head to head dual cabinet, I'm not sure why this one was even made. It's nowhere near as good as either the arcade or the home version of Super Monaco GP, which showed up in the arcades two years prior. The track is far less interesting, though if we're comparing the arcade versions, this one is just as difficult. I've tried this one many, many times, but I rarely even make it to the final lap of the first four lap race. I imagine it's a little easier if you're playing on the actual arcade machine. The graphics are average for the time and so is the audio, but hey, at least the scaling is nice. Otherwise, it's just another generic F1 racing game. The next year, Sega came out with an update called F1 Super Lab. This one adds an official F1 license, woohoo! It also allows you to choose from three different drivers slash teams. Right away you'll notice the track is more interesting and visually impressive, though I still like the track in Super Monaco GP better. You can now cycle into a cockpit view if you'd prefer it to be a little bit more like Super Monaco GP. This game also adds an overtake button which will give you a boost of speed. Unfortunately, this doesn't really seem to help much at all, at least it doesn't help me. No matter how many times I tried, I couldn't even make it to the third lap regardless if I used the overtake button or not. Again, I imagine this would be easier on the actual arcade cabinet. Overall, this is a better game than Exhaust Note, but it can't touch the gameplay of the Genesis version of Super Monaco GP. I can understand why they didn't bother to port these rather two basic racing games home. Finally, before AM2 made Virtua Fighter, they made Burning Rival here, which came out in 1992. This is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game that's clearly inspired by Street Fighter 2. You have the same range of weak and strong punch and kick attacks. Of course, each fighter has special moves and attacks for you to discover. The gameplay feels very slow, but of course in 1992, it probably didn't seem that way. As a game, it's decent, but if you're playing it in single player mode, the computer lays it on pretty thick very early on in the game, not giving you much of a chance to learn your character. For example, good luck even hurting Arnold at all when you get to him, even if he's only your second fight. He's nearly untouchable. With some rebalancing, this could have been pretty awesome. I do love how this game looks though. For its time, it had better animation than any one-on-one -on -one fighting game in the arcades. And the characters all look great, as do the various backgrounds. Unfortunately, the characters themselves aren't tremendously exciting. The sound isn't so hot. There's a loud bell like a boxing match that you'll hear constantly, which doesn't take long to become annoying. You win. I can only imagine arcade employees hearing this every few seconds for the entire day. Oh man, that would get old. Also, the stereo separation is weird, with some of the sound samples being hard pan to the left or to the right. This is yet another one of those games where the emulation isn't perfect yet, and I'm wondering if this is a result of that. Still, this is an interesting game that clearly failed to gain any momentum in the arcade, so it's no surprise it never received a home port. And yes, AM2 made this, though Yu Suzuki doesn't seem to have been directly involved. They probably did it on his day off. Round two. Dark fight!
you, loser. And there you go, more games you can't play outside of an arcade without emulation or actually obtaining the arcade hardware. And despite there being six of these episodes, there's plenty more where that came from. So what would you like to see? Or maybe you know of a game that I don't even know exists. Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSec. Playing a game in single player mode is for losers. Damn straight it is. So get the X-Band to play with your friends even when your mom says they can't come over. Only the X-Band uses the unlimited power of Alexander Graham Bell's telephone concoction to let you blast aliens together. This is awesome. I'm playing with my friend from across town. Play for as long as you want for only $12 per level. Come on, pay. You don't want to be a loser. Thank you. Let X-Band take you and your wallet into the future. Get the power of X. Hello and welcome to GameSec, and welcome to Left in the Arcade 7. In case you didn't know, this is the series that focuses on arcade games that were never ported or officially brought home. I don't want these games forgotten. Well, actually, I wouldn't mind if a couple of them were. Anyway, let's start with the beat em up. There are a lot of those that were brought home. Back in late 2017, we reviewed Konami's Crime Fighters from 1989. It's an interesting little beat-em-up that, of course, was never ported home. Well, it got a sequel in 1991 called Vendetta, but it's known as Crime Fighters 2 in Japan. This beat-em-up fixes most of the issues that Crime Fighters had, and it's a lot more enjoyable. Guess what? A girl has been kidnapped, and you have to rescue her. You have a punch and a kick button. There isn't any jump button, but if you press both attack buttons at the same time, you can do a special move, which often includes a jump kick. Fortunately, when you do this, it doesn't take any health off of your life meter. I'm honestly surprised that it doesn't. You can knock down enemies and keep pounding on them while they're down, which is fun because you know they deserve it. Yeah, that'll teach you to be evil. If you get knocked down, you'll stay down for a few seconds. But the cool thing is, is that you can still attack when you're down if there are any enemies nearby. You can collect lots of weapons that are dropped or found in crates or other smashable items. They're all fun to use, and unlike in the first game, you can pick the dropped weapon back up instead of having it disappear forever. There's also plenty of health items to find, which weren't in the first game. A lot of the enemies do perhaps take too many hits, which means it can get a touch boring when you're just waiting for an enemy to die so you can move along, but fortunately this isn't a huge deal. The game is a touch short, with only five stages plus a boss rush after that. I really like the graphics in this one. There's lots of color, and the detail in the backgrounds is always fun to admire. There's a lot of graffiti in this game, and some of it doesn't make a lot of sense. Slime balls rule, okay? I like this one that says, Vince's innocent pigs. Like the cops are gonna read that and say, oh, okay, I guess maybe we should ease up on Vince a little. This one that says graffiti died is interesting because it itself is graffiti. Could be dead graffiti though, I guess. You can't pet the dogs in this game, but you can definitely shoot them. The sound effects are perfectly fine, and the music is outstanding, which, come on, it's Konami, what did you expect? Bad music? Get out of here. <laughs> Vendetta is a fun and interesting beat-em-up, and while it's not a long game, I would have loved to see this one come home on a compilation with other Konami beat-em-ups that were also left in the arcade. Here's Kung Fu Master. This game was never ported to a home console. W wait a minute, this is the wrong Kung Fu Master game. What we want here is the Kung Fu Master Jackie Chan by Kaneko, released in 1995. Kaneko? Kaneko? Uh, I don't know, who cares? This is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game featuring, well, Jackie Chan. Choose from a huge roster of six different characters. 
I can't believe they fit so many characters on this selection screen. After that, you can choose who you fight. Notice that Jackie Chan himself is nowhere to be seen here. You have to play as one of these nobodies. Actually, they're not nobodies. They've appeared in various kung fu movies, so you may in fact recognize them. The game uses four buttons, two punch and two kicks. Holding back blocks, kind of. The gameplay is very difficult and the CPU can figure out everything you're trying to do immediately. You have to play very defensively. Let the computer attack, back up, and then hit your opponent right after they attack. Playing offensively will get you killed very quickly. I was able to have the most luck with the character known as Kim Marie, who's played by the actress named, well, Kim Marie. Her victory screens are something else. Just look at her face. She is so happy that she won. After you win a few matches, you can actually choose to fight Jackie Chan. Needless to say, he's practically invincible. The game reminds me of Way of the Warrior on the 3DO, only a bit sharper looking. Like that one, this has stages that zoom in and out. It also has fatalities, but they're pretty tame as Jackie Chan doesn't really like things too bloody or gory. The graphics themselves aren't anything special for their time and honestly probably a bit dated for 1995. The sound is a bit shrill, but otherwise fun to listen to. I might as well mention the follow-up called Jackie Chan Fists of Fire, which was another 1995 game from Kaneko. This is more of an update to Kung Fu Master than anything. You have the same selectable characters, but many have been tinted one color or another for some reason. I guess players in the arcade love the hell out of that and are more likely to pump in some quarters if your guy's skin is tinted blue. That's money in the bank, my friend. What's more is that now you can select three different versions of Jackie Chan to play as. They all basically play the same from what I can tell, and I'm betting the only reason there are three of them is to make it look like there's more than seven characters total. Jackie even shows up as a regular opponent, and you can easily beat him. Of course, he practically acts like he let you win. You're getting better. The gameplay's been rebalanced, and yes, that is some good news. Unfortunately, the game is also a lot slower. The same stages are here, but again, they've been tinted with some colors now, so you'll pump in those quarters. The sound and music seems mostly the same. Overall, this is definitely the better of the two games, but neither is as good as the Jackie Chan games that showed up on the NES and the TurboGrafx-16. I can't say I'm sad that these never got ported home. Okay, so far we've had a beat em up and a couple of fighting games, but what about running guns and platformers? Yeah. Up next is the generically named Crime City. Crime City from Daito, released in 1989. Yes, that's how the company's name is pronounced. This is basically a side-scrolling running gun where you control a plainclothes cop who shoots down bad guys with his gun and other random guns that he picks up on the street. The gameplay immediately reminds me of E-SWAT, Shinobi, Rolling Thunder, OutRun. Okay, maybe not OutRun. Why did I even say that? You have a life bar, but don't get excited. You'll take damage if you touch enemies or get hit by a car, but if a single bullet or other object tossed by the enemy touches you, it's instant death. You can jump, and if you hold up while pressing jump, you can high jump. You don't have unlimited ammo, so you need to pick up more by grabbing the gun icons. You don't have any special moves, and there's not even any ninja magic, only you're training as a highly decorated police officer. Each level has you foiling some type of crime, like a bank robbery. All along the way, the criminals are out to get you. I like how in this stage, a helicopter lowers you down onto some cars so you can platform your way across. Of course, there are thugs with guns waiting on top of almost every car you see. That's right, they're just casually waiting on cars speeding down the freeway for a hotshot cop with a chip on his shoulder to come wandering by. I'm kind of curious why the helicopter couldn't have just taken him directly to the bank. No, it has to drop him on a speeding highway. A couple of times, you'll actually face towards the screen to shoot enemies down in the distance. This can be a bit weird, but it's nice to see a bit of variety. The gameplay itself controls well and it feels great, but this is a huge quarter muncher. It quickly becomes quite difficult to avoid bullets, and you need to keep track of so much different stuff all at once if you hope to beat it on a single quarter. 
The graphics are decent, but by 1989 standards, they were already dated. Everything looks and moves a bit stiff, and there's no parallax scrolling to speak of, which is quite odd. Shinobi had arrived two years earlier, and it blows this one away graphically. In fact, Eswat and Rolling Thunder all preceded this one, and I feel this looks the worst of them all. Still kinda decent, though. The music isn't bad. It's by Taito's popular Zantata sound team, and the game sounds close to what you'd hear on the Sega Genesis. Alas, it's in mono, unsurprisingly. The game offers up six stages, so it's not the longest if you just plow your way through. I'm a bit surprised that Taito didn't bring this home to the Genesis. They seem to want to bring everything else out for the console, and this probably would have done well. Though for home play, I think they should have implemented that life bar for getting shot as well. Maybe take one hit and be mostly okay, and then the next hit kills you unless you find a power-up. It would have also been nice if they added a parallax layer or two in a few of the stages which home players expected by that point. I don't think this game would have been compromised very much if it were a 4 or 8 meg cartridge. Oh, and this is another game where you can't pet the dogs, but you can shoot them. This is DD Crew from Sega, which was released in 1991. This one is a beat em up, and I'm gonna be real with you. It's one of the worst beat em ups I've ever played. The characters that you can choose from are all uninteresting. The enemies that you fight are all boring. You have one attack button plus a jump. Not to mention that the control is laggy and just all around bad. It's not enjoyable at all to play, and honestly, I couldn't play it for more than 15 minutes because it's just so bad, and not in a good way. That said, there are a few good things here. Unfortunately, none of that involves the gameplay. I like how you fight the first stage boss on this amusement park ride as it keeps going around and around. That's a cool idea. It would have been even cooler if the physics pushed you a bit back and forth as it swung around. After that, you're fighting inside of a gondola. Now you're out on top of it and it looks kind of cool. Oh, and most of the music is completely sampled. The music itself, though, is only okay, and there's not a lot of it, as you'll hear the same tracks in future stages. Not sure why they spent such a huge memory budget on the game's music. Ultimately, even the music is completely ruined by the game's awful sound effects. This is what you're going to be listening to the entire time you're playing. No, 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 no. Yikes, let me tell you, that is unpleasant. And yes, there's an elevator section. Sega is often praised for their amazing arcade games, but you never hear about their bad ones. They seem to have a lot of arcade games that are just bad. As much of a Sega fan as I am, the truth needs to be known. Stay away from this one. Here's Magical Cat Adventure from Win Techno, released in 1993. This one only ever appeared in Japan and Europe. This is the only game that the Japanese company Win Techno ever made that I can find. Anyway, as you can see, you play as a cat and this is a platformer. You walk on your back two legs because hey, that's what all cats do. Since you're a magical cat on an adventure, you can shoot projectiles. There are treasure chests flying around and if you shoot one, you can get a different style of projectile attack. Most of them feel pretty weak. In fact, the only one I really like is this one because it's not super small. As you play, you'll find yourself changing weapons, even if you don't want to. You can collect coins and sometimes gems for some reason. I assume the coins give you an extra cat if you get 100 of them, but I've never been able to hang on to that many. I'm not sure what the gems do for you. They certainly don't give out extra continues, only your quarters will do that. Actually, they won't since this game wasn't released in the United States, but you know what I mean! The stages can be pretty long, and eventually you'll make it to a boss fight. The control can feel pretty laggy at times, almost a quarter of a second of lag from my guess. This doesn't help the game at all. On top of that, it takes a cue from Sonic and features very strange momentum-based controls. That means if he starts out on an incline, he can barely move at all, just like Sonic's weird physics. He gets going pretty fast, and good luck reacting in time with this laggy control. All in all, the gameplay seems rather generic. 
I really do like all of the color and detail in the graphics though, at least in the backgrounds. You gotta admit, it looks pretty nice. All in all, I'm rather surprised that this is an arcade game, especially one that wasn't ported home. It just looks and plays like a home game, you don't usually see stuff like this in the arcade. But hey, it's still 30 to 40 times better than Bubsy. Yeah, I'll die on that hill. Don't you hate that saying? All right, we've been looking at a decent variety of genres, so let's continue to diversify with one of the rarest racing games ever made. This one is called Slipstream, and it was released in 1995. This F1 game is interesting in quite a few ways. First of all, it's from Capcom. Capcom isn't exactly known for making racing games. Secondly, it's a Capcom arcade game that uses Sega arcade hardware, specifically the System 32 board. That's the same hardware that runs Golden Axe Revenge of Death Adder. Next, this arcade game was only ever released in Latin America, though some sources say it was specific to Brazil. The menus feature a mix of Portuguese, English, and Japanese. This is an extremely rare game with only about 150 known units that existed. Daytona and Ridge Racer already existed in the arcades at this time, so it was interesting to see a 2D-based racing game like this that doesn't use polygons. The gameplay is fairly straightforward. Choose a mode, choose one of eight different cars, and race. You have a shift lever to select between high and low gear. If you ride behind one of the evil enemy racers, you charge up your turbo meters and then get a boost of speed when you move out from behind their car. But the enemy can do the same to you and even each other. Different cars have different amounts of turbo for their slipstream. This is a rather difficult game that just barely gives you enough time. One wrong move and you'll be retired as your timer runs out, even if you're in first or second place. Place first and you move on to the next track, and there are a total of four. There's also another mode where you have to pass a certain number of enemies within your two lap race. The good news is that you get to worry about the timer too. This mode is pretty fun, but again, it's pretty tough. Then, there's another mode where you can choose to race on one of the four tracks against one other opponent. You'll likely be boosting past each other a lot during these races. Overall, the game is super fun, but the unforgiving difficulty might bring that down a hair for some people. I'm pretty sure playing on an actual arcade unit would be a lot better, but good luck doing that. The graphics are really good, and they still look great even in the age of 3D racers made of polygons. Everything is super fast, though here it looks like I might be getting a bit too close to the opera house in Sydney, or maybe the water in front of it. The sound and music are both full of energy and super fun. I like what they bring to the game. It's just sad that this was never included on any compilations from Capcom. Just because hardly anyone has ever heard of it doesn't mean people wouldn't enjoy playing it. Come on, Capcom, give us more compilations of your arcade games similar to what you were doing in the PS2 era and include this one on there. Finally, we have a weird one called The Crystal of Kings, and it was made by Brezasoft in 2001. This is a beat-em-up that plays a lot like Golden Axe. It's another fairly rare game that was only ever released at arcades in Asia and Australia. Despite that, it's all in English. There's not a lick of Australian text anywhere. Go figure. Probably a good thing, because I can't read Australian anyway. Now, just who the hell is, or should I say was, Brezasoft? It was a small company made up of ex-SNK developers. They made this game on their own arcade hardware, but the company would later be purchased by SNK Playmore. Heh, <laughs> they thought they could escape SNK. Get back to work, bitches. They'd eventually work on Metal Slug 4 and 5. Anyway, like I said, this one plays much like Golden Axe. You have a choice of four different characters with their own attack styles and magic attacks. The generic sword dude isn't bad, but the generic blonde chick is even better because she's a bit faster. Oh, and just like Golden Axe, she has the best magic. The other two characters feel a tad useless. In fact, I just kept killing myself as this guy just so I could play as someone else, anyone else. 
I probably wouldn't do this though if I were actually spending my own money to play this game in an arcade. The magic is also similar to Golden Axe in that you collect vials to fill your magic bar. The more full it is, the stronger your magic attack is. Along the way, you'll find fairies which you can free and then collect. They'll help you in various ways. They can attack the enemy, constantly give you life points or magic points and stuff like that. Be careful though, because there's an evil fairy that will reverse your controls for about 10 seconds. Oh, and get this, you have status effects. It's kind of weird seeing these outside of an RPG. The controls are okay, but the gameplay itself doesn't feel anywhere near as smooth as Golden Axe. The graphics are chock full of pre-rendered sprites and backgrounds. It definitely has an interesting look. I am really surprised though that they went this route. Pre-rendered graphics were all the rage in 1994 through maybe 1997 or so. But this was 2001, the PlayStation 2 is already out so it was an odd choice. This has got to be one of the last if not the last game to use pre-rendered graphics like this. Until Actraiser Resurrection came out anyway. Still, I do kind of like how it looks in a lot of places, especially during the boss fights. The sound is a bit tinny and it feels like maybe the sample rate is rather low. I'm not a big fan of how it sounds, though you do get used to it after a few levels. Still, the game does try hard to do its best Yngwie Malmsteen impression during this boss fight. It's no wonder that this one was never ported home. It was made by a small company, it had a tiny run, and it's not a tremendously exciting game. Our only hope for it to come home would be if SNK released some collections of their non-Neo Geo games. But they already did that, and guess what? It wasn't included. No big loss, really. There you go, that was eight more games that never made it home, at least not yet. I do wish my emulation abilities were a little bit better because there are a lot of more visually complex games that I could show you, but as of right now, I can't. It's not just about the hardware, but more my lack of interest in getting the emulators and ROMs all working together and running properly. That's just really not my scene. But if it's yours, there are a lot of cool games that you could try. So. What are some other games that have been left in the arcade that perhaps I haven't covered yet? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Do you want to save your games to a memory card, but you're sick of swapping it out with a rumble pack? I sure am. Well, then just quit swapping them out and leave the memory card in there. But I still want the buzzy buzzy. Well, did you know you could attach the memory card to the console itself? No. It's true. Just power your system off, take out this dumb thing, and insert your memory card. Now throw that dumb old thing away. <laughs> You're good to go, power up and have fun. Nothing happens. That's because you just broke your Nintendo 64, you idiot. But you told me that- Do you just listen to any random disembodied voice that shows up out of nowhere telling you to do stuff? Yeah. Then you deserve this. Won't somebody help me? Hello and welcome to GameSack. A lot of you have been asking me again and again to make an episode about the arcade games which I own. 
And by a lot of you, I mean one of you. Still, I gave it some thought and figured I could make something enjoyable out of it. And as you can see, I've already failed. Anyway, let's take a look at how I'm able to play arcade games at home. Arcade games come on big, scary PCBs like this. And if you didn't know, PCB stands for Printed Circuit Board. This is more than just a glorified game cartridge. The entire graphics, audio, and logic hardware are all built on here. Each board is its very own system. To play these, I hook it up to what's called a super gun. A super gun basically takes the audio and video from the board, which is already in analog form, and routes them to an output. It also allows you to connect power and joystick control to the board in one handy hookup called JAMA, which is a standardized connection that the arcade industry eventually came up with. I use the HAS or HAS super gun, I'm not sure if there's a correct pronunciation or not, but I find this to be the best one available. It outputs legal video properly attenuated at 75 ohms. This means that it has the necessary circuitry to safely match the signal and impedance of consumer grade equipment like your TV or a Framemeister or what have you. It comes with two DB15 joystick ports which work great with a Neo Geo joystick. You'll also need a proper external power supply like this one so you can dial in 5 volts down to the T. From there, you connect your RGB cabling to go to a compatible monitor or a transcoder. If I use an RGB to component transcoder, I can play on my Toshiba CRT here and it looks amazing. I also sometimes play on my PVM monitor. <laughs> There you go, a very oversimplified explanation of how I play arcade games at home. Now is the part of the show where I show you each and every one of my 11 arcade PCBs in action, and all the video game footage in this episode has been recorded from said PCB. So without further ado, let's get into it. Of course, I'm going to start out with Shinobi from Sega, which was released in the arcades in 1987. Looking at the board, we see that this is a System 16B type. Since my super gun is JAMA, I need an adapter so it can be powered, controlled, and monitored by JAMA equipment. That's right, System 16B is not JAMA. We also see this EEPROM, which is labeled Shinobi A7 Sound Fix with the Z80B. What is this all about? Well, when I received the game, it had no sound at all. It turns out that a lot of Sega games use what is called a suicide battery as a form of copy protection. When the battery is removed or dies, the game stops working, or at least part of it does. In my case, it was the sound, since the Z80 CPU is what was affixed to the battery. So I had to change out the Z80 CPU and the sound ROM to accommodate it, which cost me a total of about $20, which the seller of the board happily reimbursed me for. For those of you outside of the United States who are confused and perhaps a bit angry, when I say Z80, just pretend I said Z80. Awesome, we're good. Anyway, now the game works perfectly. This is called phoenixing, as basically you raise the board from the dead. What's funny is that there are some super snobby people out there who would never dare play on a phoenix board because it's just not the original experience. Eh, screw those guys, I want to play my shinobi forever. Anyway, you play as Ninja Joe Musashi and you're on a mission to rescue kids and take down the evil Z Corporation, or Z Corporation outside of the US. You have to rescue all of the pink kids before you're allowed to exit the stage. I've told this story before, but this is the first game I ever played where I learned to jump up and down between different levels. The first time I was playing stage one, I couldn't figure out how to get back down and some dude standing nearby told me to press down and jump at the same time. I tell you, it was like a whole new world had opened up to me. I love how I can throw shurikens almost as fast as I can press the button. Each stage also lets you use ninja magic once. And who can forget about the amazing bonus stages which are super fun. If you win one of these, you get an extra dude. But really, you'll probably be losing most of the time. Doesn't matter, these bonus stages are still crazy fun though. Once you get to the final set of stages, you can no longer continue even if you've inserted tons of quarters. The graphics may look kind of plain today, but I always thought that they were super cool. I love how fast and responsive everything is. The music is amazing as well, making great use of FM synthesis. I especially love the game over music. And the voices are really cool as well. Mission 4. 
You can definitely hear the difference in quality here versus emulated versions like MAME. Mission 1. Finished. Welcome to bonus stage. Mission 1. Finished. Welcome to bonus stage. This game is a blast to play and one of my favorite arcade games ever. I'm super happy to have it in my collection and it's probably the arcade game I pull down to play the most. Next up is the Astyanix from Jalico, released in 1989. Or Astyanix, I guess that's more accurate, but less fun to say. This is completely different from the NES version, but it has a similar playstyle and it's from the same designer. And that designer is Tokohiro Takamori. He first worked on the legendary acts for the PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16, and Astyanix plays similarly. Basically, you have a weapon that's tied to a bar on the screen. The bar refills as long as you're not attacking. If you attack when the bar is full, your attack is super strong. Your attacks are weaker if you're attacking quickly and the bar doesn't have time to refill much. The board itself is quite large and has a hefty daughter board attached. What's weird is this adapter board attached to the business end. I'm not sure what this is all about, but it looks to be made by Jalico themselves. It seems to be a straight pass-through board with some resistors applied for one reason or another. There's really no reason for me to remove it, so of course it stays. I also received this arcade marquee with the game. This is pretty cool and it's also the only arcade marquee that I actually own. The game itself is pretty fun, if a bit unremarkable. You can play with a friend or even a total stranger and you're both on screen at the very same time. What will they think of next? Basically, you just work your way through the stage killing enemies like giant mantises. Or maybe even some skeletons. At the end of the stage is a cool boss and usually they're pretty big and detailed. Okay, well, not always big. You also have a couple of items that you can collect. The little winged shield thing will give you a big magic attack which can be powered up if you collect more. The rounded shield gives you some temporary defense. The game is pretty short and you can blast through it in about 20 minutes with unlimited continues. This is par for the course with a lot of arcade games though. The variety in the stages is nice, but in the final stage you're fighting aliens. This seems so out of place. The graphics are pretty good, and I like the color in most of the areas. The music is okay at best, but you won't be hearing much of it. Instead, all you'll hear is the constant grunting of your character each and every time they attack. It's fine if you're the one who's playing, but if you're just watching, then wow does it get old fast. All in all, the game isn't amazing by any means, but it's not a bad time. I've never played or even seen this one in an actual arcade. Well, maybe Galloping Ghost had one and I passed it by or something, but I certainly never saw one when it was recent. I'm honestly not sure why I bought it. It must not have been very expensive, but, you know, I don't regret it. Whoa! I don't just happen to have side-scrolling action platformers, right? I have to have more variety. Well, as it turns out, I do have two games that definitely do not fit in that mold. Not by choice, mind you, but anyway, check them out. Many years ago, a viewer sent me two cheap arcade games that I think he got in a lot and had duplicates of. Either way, he didn't want them, so he sent them to me despite me telling him that I had absolutely no way to play them. However, it prompted me to take the dive into getting the stuff I needed to play arcade games at home. The first of these games is Premier Soccer by Konami and it was released in 1993. This is a cool little soccer game. Or football for those of you who don't say soccer. Please leave your angry comments about how horrible the United States is for saying soccer below and how we should all just die. Anyway, the board itself is pretty modest, but it does have a connection for stereo sound. Just be sure to flip up the dip switch here to enable it. Anyway, your team represents an entire country and all of its inhabitants. So if you win, everyone in your country is a winner. Yes, that's how it works, no pressure. You then choose the size of your play field. Basically, this is how far zoomed in the camera is. You can have it way zoomed out, which lets you see a good portion of the field. 
or way zoomed in. In this mode, the scrolling is insanely fast and it's really hard to keep track of anything. One of the middle settings is usually the best and it defaults to the second option. When you're on defense, you control the player that's closest to the ball and this can mess you up sometimes because the control keeps switching around and suddenly you're running away from the ball. You have two buttons, pass and shoot. There's also a single penalty you can get. Push it, you're booked, direct free kick. The graphics are pretty good if a bit basic. It's sometimes difficult to tell which is your team and who is the enemy. If you end in a tie, there's a touch of scaling and rotation when you settle in to do your penalty kicks, but unfortunately that's as flashy as this game ever gets. The stereo music is pretty good, though I wish there were more musical themes. Overall, like I said, not a bad little soccer game. The other game he sent is a 1995 title called Party Time, Ganta the Diver 2 from Mitchell. The board is pretty simple and unassuming. I don't know why this chip is all marked over though. Actually look, quite a few of them are. What the hell is going on here? This is a tile flipping game where you reveal an image. Also, it's the only arcade game that I own that happens to be in tape mode. Anyway, you are Ganta, or at least I assume. You dive into a tile and can swim underneath everything and then re-emerge at any unflipped tile. All the while, there are things wandering around the board to make your life difficult. There are also items to collect, and honestly, I don't know what each of them do because this is maybe the second or third time I've ever played this. You see, you're revealing images of cartoon women. As you progress further, the ladies become less and less equipped with clothing and eventually fully nude. Honestly though, it doesn't matter what the images are, this game is pretty boring. But I had to show it to you since it's an arcade PCB that I have. Glad I didn't pay for it. Here's Rastan from Taito, another one of my favorites from the arcade, and it was released in 1987. Looking at the PCB, it's pretty simple with only one layer and a fairly clean look. One thing that you should know about this game is that it absolutely requires the negative 5 volts from your arcade power supply. If you don't have that, well, you won't have any audio. This is currently the only board that I have that needs the negative 5 volt line connected, at least that I know of. Anyway, I really like this game and I was super happy when it came home to the Master System. You play as a Conan the Barbarian ripoff and you hack and slash your way through the stage. Eventually, you'll make it to a door. Go inside and you'll wander around a decently large castle. Get through that and you'll meet up with the boss. But he's not the boss of you, so just kill him. This game is super tough and I'm not kidding at all when I say that. There are plenty of checkpoints and you have a life bar, but this game will still make short work of you. I don't think I ever got to the first boss in an actual arcade back in the day. Thankfully though, I have unlimited quarters playing at home. There are some icons you can grab which can refill your life, give you more power temporarily, or even take some of your life away, so be careful. There are also a few weapons to grab, like the axe, which is more powerful than the sword. There's also the mace, which extends your attack range greatly, just like a real mace. Or my favorite, the flaming sword. I like this because it shoots a little ball of fire, just like you'd expect any sword that's on fire to do. I guess the hilt of the sword is like one big oven mitt, or else Rastan would drop it as soon as he grabbed it. Either that or Rastan doesn't have time to feel pain. See what I did there? I took a line from Predator, but changed the words around, so I made it like my own, so it's not like, you know, yeah, let's move on. This is another one of those games where the final level doesn't let you continue at all. Even with the difficulty and slightly stiff controls, this is really fun. I like the graphics, even though I feel there could be more variety sometimes since things begin to repeat themselves a bit. This board of mine also has some really bad video quality. I'm not sure why it does, but if we zoom in here, you can really see it. See those vertical jail bars? Maybe it needs new capacitors? Maybe the PCB needs some sort of RGB bypass? I have no idea. Also, I can't fit the entire game on screen as it goes beyond the normal overscan of any of my monitors. 
I can fit it enough to make it playable though. I love the music in this game, but the same three tunes play on each stage. One for the outside, one for the inside, and the other for the boss fight. I'm glad to have this one and it's fun to play even though I'm quite sure I'll never be able to beat it. This next game I didn't even know existed until we did our side-scrolling run and gun episode. That was episode 20, and this is episode 268 for comparison. I covered a game and I was told by you guys that you should have covered its sequel because it's way better. And you know what? You guys are absolutely right. And I'm finally glad that I can say I own it. This is Gun Force 2 from IREM, released in 1994. This is the sequel to Gun Force 1, which itself really isn't worth talking about because this game is leagues better. This has never been ported to a home console, but it is available for the IREM arcade hits for Mac and PC. This was developed by the same team who would go on to form Nazca, who are famous for the Metal Slug series. In fact, in many ways, this game could be called Metal Slug Zero. The PCB itself is typical of IRAM at the time, featuring two layers with a larger board on top. I always used to have issues with this game freezing, but since I started using the Haas Super Gun in my current power supply, it's been nothing but smooth city. You play as a dude, either alone or with some other person, and the game is a run and gun. Like I said, it's very similar to Metal Slug. Your default weapon looks kind of like a blue version of the heavy machine gun from Metal Slug, and you can even power up each weapon a bit. And speaking of other weapons, there are a few others like the laser beam or the fire. You can even get into a ton of different vehicles with their own firepower. Being in these will protect you from enemy fire for a small period of time. You even rescue hostages, but instead of dirty guys, they are sexy women. They don't give you power-ups when you rescue them, just a nice little noise to make you know that they appreciated you touching them. One thing that this game doesn't have that Metal Slug does are grenades. You just have your main weapons here and that's it. Of course, at the end of each stage you fight a crazy boss. Between each stage you can go up in rank and also increase your pay grade all depending on how many women you rescued and whatnot. But honestly, this isn't something that matters much unless you're playing for score. The game is super fun and you'd think it would be repetitive, but surprisingly it's really not bad in that area at all. The visuals are outstanding, just like you'd expect from this team. Everything is hyper detailed and well animated. Explosions are going off all over the place and it makes everything feel super intense. The sound is great as well and it reminds me of Metal Slug. The music is just as good, though each stage doesn't have its own unique theme. Speaking of stages, there are only five of them here before the game loops. Still, this one is insanely fun and I'm happy to have it in my collection. Speaking of Metal Slug, here's Metal Slug 5 from SNK, released in 2003. That's right, this is one of my arcade PCBs. I didn't even know that SNK produced these at the time, but hey, apparently they did. It's a tiny little thing and basically a miniaturized Neo Geo without a cartridge port. It was quite a bit cheaper than a Neo Geo MVS cartridge of the same game at the time and way cheaper than an AES cartridge. So I got this. And hey, it's Metal Slug, though at this point Nazca wasn't really a thing anymore. Instead, this was made by Noise Factory. This takes place after Metal Slug 7, and you're supposed to just know that, even though Metal Slug 6 and 7 hadn't even been made yet for some weird reason. You can't jump down from a higher level like in Shinobi and Gun Force 2, but you can do a sweet new slide move. There are only five stages, but there are a couple of areas with branching paths, so you'll need to play it two more times if you want to see everything. 
Still, there's some fun vehicles to ride, including this crazy spidery one in the second half of the game. Other than that stuff, pretty much everything here has already been done in the previous games. It's still cool though. The graphics remain excellent with new backgrounds and awesome animation. The music is real instruments streamed in mono with low quality, but I like it nonetheless. However, a few of the sound effects can have some distortion. If I recall correctly, the real Neo Geo versions do that too. This is a fun game that I got fairly cheap, so I feel it's a good addition. Ghouls and Ghosts from Capcom is a phenomenal game that was released in late 1988. The first time I had heard about the game was when it was announced as being one of the first games for the upcoming Genesis. I learned that this was the arcade sequel to Ghosts and Goblins. Soon before the Genesis came out, a local game store called Buyback Games, rest in peace, got the arcade. I noticed it when I went in to rent some games. I played it once and <laughs> I thought it was really cool. And of course, once the Genesis version came out, I fell in love with the game and it's still one of my favorite games to this day. So it's only natural that I'd want the arcade version in my collection. Looking at the PCB, it's a little odd. First of all, it's a Capcom CPS-1, but that's not what's odd at all. For whatever reason, the previous owner decided to put little ghouls and ghost stickers on all of the EEPROMs. I'm guessing he liked to pull out and switch games around to play different things on this board. Whatever, this works great. So basically at the beginning, you head out to get some food or something and get lost. Three years later, you find your way back and everything you know and love is under attack. Time to set off and rid the world of demons again. This game is about 50 or 60 times better than Ghosts and Goblins. <laughs> Maybe 80 times better. There are many more weapons. The stages are much cooler and you can even shoot up and down. I can pretty much blow through this game, but I'm not immune to dying. However, a lot of my deaths come from committing suicide because it's the only recourse over getting a bad weapon like the sword. I don't want to be stuck with that. I generally stick with the default spear, flying disc, or the dagger. Once I get the dagger, I stop looking for weapons. You can also get magic armor for some special attacks. These are all different and depend on what weapon you currently have. And yes, you need to go through the game twice and I wouldn't have it any other way. Unfortunately, this is the US version of the game. Why is that bad? Because it's so easy. There are tons upon tons of checkpoints in every stage. In the Japanese version, there's only one checkpoint midway through any given stage. And no, this isn't because I'm playing on a board where some guy likes to switch games out and put labels on the EEPROMs. That's just the way the US version is, even on its hardest dip setting. This can be verified in MAME. Still, I'm in love with everything about this game otherwise. Like the amazing organic looking graphics or the memorable music with different themes for each and every boss. And of course, the tricky gameplay, which is amazing. This is far and away my favorite game in the entire Ghosts and Goblins slash Ghouls and Ghosts series. One of the arcade games I absolutely had to get was Choplifter from Sega, released in 1985. This is one of the arcade games that convinced me to buy a Sega Master System and it's also one of the first two games I bought for that console. The board is insanely huge, but at least it only has one layer. This is running on Sega's System 8 board and it was made before JAMA was a thing. And because of that, it needs an appropriate adapter to run on my super gun. Anyway, Sega bought the rights to make an arcade version of Dan Gorlin's computer game and in the process they made it about 36 times more fun and interesting, maybe 37. 
The premise is that the enemy has 32 hostages being held in every stage. You need to rescue 20 of them. It doesn't matter which 20, so long as you get 20. The other 12 people, they can just go straight to hell. Here's the thing though, you can only fit eight hostages in your helicopter at once. What are you gonna do? Well, you need to find the bases where the hostages are being held, blast it open, collect them, and then fly back to your base. And you'll need to do this multiple times thanks to the aforementioned limited capacity of your helicopter. If you get shot down, you lose a life. If you get shot down with hostages in your helicopter, those hostages all die. If more than 12 hostages die, then you can no longer rescue 20 of them, so the stage resets and you try again, as long as you have a life left. You may notice me bouncing up and down as I collect hostages. Doing this prevents the tanks from coming. You can only kill tanks and other foreground objects by pressing the button so your helicopter faces the screen. I learned this by playing the Master System version. That version also taught me to fly backwards in the caves, but sadly it doesn't work quite as well here. This game is absolutely relentless. It will kick your ass six ways from Sunday. You will die a lot. There also aren't any continues. The Master System version is definitely more balanced than this one. However, the arcade has an exclusive city stage after the cave. The Master System game changes this to a nighttime version of the first stage. Both games loop after that. The graphics here are pretty good considering it's running on their 8-bit board. Of course, I've always loved the parallax scrolling. The music is also pretty good, and I absolutely love the crude yet really cute voices. This game isn't for everyone, but it always makes me smile. Man, I'm so glad I finally got to show off my Choplifter PCB. I love that game. Anyway, I've still got two games to show you. I wonder why I wore this shirt today. Ah yes, here we have Golden Axe, The Revenge of Death Adder from Sega, released in 1992. This has never been released for home consoles in any way as of the making of this video. However, Arcade 1UP has announced a version of this, so be on the lookout, but it's not gonna be cheap. The board is Sega's System 32. That's right, it's 32 bits! And it's pretty beefy with a very large daughter board on top. It has a label on it that says Golden Axe 2 despite coming out after the Genesis Golden Axe 2. One of these two games is lying. This is a beat em up or perhaps the term hack em up would be more suitable. You can choose from four different characters and up to four players can play at the same time. The characters are one of the few very minor complaints that I have about this game. They're kind of weird. I just wish that in addition to these characters we could also have the original ones from the first game here. I mean, I guess we have the sword guy, but I'm not sure he's supposed to be the same person. The dwarf is kind of here, but he's riding on the back of this big dude. Oh well. As you hack your way through the game, you'll sometimes be able to choose your path, which adds to the replayability. I'm lucky to have the US version, which has all of the levels in it. I'm also lucky to have gotten it for the prize I did, which was right under $300, and that was insanely cheap even at the time. It's still the most money I've ever spent on a single game though. Still, this game is crazy awesome and I love the close-ups of the enemies getting absolutely wrecked when you use your magic. You should have just stayed home today, pal. The graphics are great and even feature some full screen System 32 scaling here and there. The sound and music are also great and are presented in stereo. The game does get a bit repetitious after a while though as you'll find yourself fighting way too many of these guys too often. Unfortunately, some arcade PCBs aren't really built to last. Mine no longer produces any sound. I had to resort to an older recording I thankfully made in 2016 of this game for this episode. If I do the memory test, IC16 comes up as bad. 
IC-16 is sitting right next to the Z-80, which is responsible for handling the audio. Apparently, this isn't an uncommon problem with the System32 board. However, as of right now, I haven't been able to find a way to fix it. People have replaced the IC-16 and even the Z-80, checked the traces and everything else and still no audio, and it still comes up as bad in the memory test. This is definitely one of the downsides about collecting arcades, as they can be extremely fickle. Anyone in the Denver metro area know how to fix this? Anyway, regardless, this game is one of my pride and joys, though honestly I'm not very proud to no longer have any audio. Finally, I was able to acquire X-Men vs. Street Fighter from a viewer recently, well kind of recently. This Capcom game was released in 1996. This uses the Capcom CPS2 system and so far it's my only CPS2 game. Basically, the top comes off and you can swap out the games like giant cartridges. There's also a suicide battery in these things and once it dies I'll probably get it modded to have all of the CPS2 games in it if I can figure out how. When this one is powered on, it's crazy loud because the fan in this thing just wants to move all the air in the world. Yikes. This one also needs to be connected to what's called a kick harness which allows for six button support. JAMA officially only supports three buttons per joystick port so this extra setup lets you control the kicks, hence the name. I also used my Saturn Pad adapter for this one since I don't own any six button joysticks that fit into the Neo Geo controller port. Anyway, this one on one fighting game is phenomenal. You have some Street Fighter characters and some X-Men characters. You pick any two and your enemy also picks two. You can switch between them at any time during the match trying to keep at least one alive. Whoever defeats both of the other two characters wins the match. It's exactly like the Saturn version with the exception of the loading times. There aren't any loading times here, but it's not a huge advantage because the Saturn version still loads super fast. The graphics are amazing and I love the animation in this one. Same with the music and sound. This one has Q sound, which means you can hear some fake surround sound, but only if your head is smack in the middle between the two speakers. Even then, the effect isn't amazing, but it still sounds good. Some of the voices are so silly, I love them. This is X-Men versus Street Fighter. You'll not see anything like it in the whole world. Overall, this is a fantastic game and I'm amazed that it hasn't suicided itself after 24 years. I'm glad though. Well, there you go. That's all of the actual arcade games that I happen to own. I didn't talk about the Neo Geo MVS cartridges that I own because, well, that's kind of a gray area for me anyway. And I don't think there can be another one of these episodes for a very, very long time because it takes a while to get all these and they're not cheap. They're going up in price and that really, really sucks. Well, maybe I can cover one of my friend's collections. Who knows? Anyway, do you own any arcade PCBs? How about full-size cabinets? I wish I owned full-size cabinets, but they take up a lot of room. And then you have to worry about maintenance on the CRTs and all that stuff. So eh, that's really not for me unless I just had one or two. Anyway, let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. And you. But not you.
You know, Choplifter is a fantastic arcade game. I love playing it a lot. However, I feel that the Master System version is slightly more balanced, so let's play that. Well, this is a good game, but I wish the graphics were a little bit better. It just doesn't have the power. What should I do? I know this was a dumb joke, but they can't all be winners. <laughs>